गुड मॉर्निंग नमस्कार ये नेशनल वेबिनार में आप सबका स्वागत है ऑल ऑफ यू आर वेलकम टू दिस नेशनल वेबिनार ऑन ऑर्गेन डोनेशन ऑर्गेन एंड टिश्यू डोनेशन सॉरी फॉर लिटिल डिले बिकॉज ऑफ द टेक्निकल ग्लिचेस वी आर दिस वेबिनार इज बीइंग ऑर्गेनाइज ऑन द ओकेजन ऑफ अंगदान महोत्सव under the azadi ka amrit mahotsav and this month is organ donation month we have indian organ donation day next month on 3rd of august which will which we will be observing all over the country and this webinar is aiming to give information and this is focusing on uh, uh, information about the deceased organ donation which we need to promote for taking care of the need of various organs and tissues for the patients who are waiting uh, for these organs for saving their lives and the second component of this webinar is prevention uh, which will be beginning which is very important that we should uh, be uh, uh, having Uh, the uh, uh, the prevention the health promotion the healthy lifestyles so that the diseases which cause organ failure they are not uh, their burden in a, which is high in our country goes down and we are able to reduce the demand for organ for treating the organ failure diseases so main dr anil kumar in shabdon ke sath director noto आप सबका स्वागत करता हूं इस वेबिनार में और हमारा पहला ये वेबिनार को मॉडरेट करने के लिए डॉक्टर अर्चना सिंह अभी जो हमारे फर्स्ट स्पीकर हैं डॉक्टर संजय अग्रवाल हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ नेफ्रोलॉजी एम्स न्यू दिल्ली शी विल बी इंट्रोड्यूसिंग एंड देन डॉक्टर अग्रवाल फॉर द नोबल कॉज एंड प्रिवेंट ऑर्गन फेलियर बाय सेंसिटाइजिंग पीपल टू अडॉप्ट हेल्दी लाइफस्टाइल and for a healthy lifestyle it is necessary to know how you can prevent such disease especially kidney disease which are the most prevalent in india to get an insight on this i would request dr sanjay agarwal who is professor and head of the department of nephrology in aims to address the participants as far as the introduction of uh, dr agarwal is concerned sir have more than 38 years of experience he is uh, being the great teacher clinician he has he have uh, remarkably worked in the organ transplantation and also to strengthen the organ donation policy in the country so my words will fall short in introducing him so i'll request sir to kindly take the first session which is on prevention of kidney disease so good morning everybody over in next 20 25 minutes i will cover uh, is that why uh, should chronic kidney disease uh, should be taken in a prevention uh, mode so that to decrease the burden of kidney transplantation which is the commonest uh, organ donation across the world including india परसिस्ट <laughs> For more than three months to label it as a chronic kidney disease, so as to differentiate it from acute kidney disease. And what is the evidence of kidney damage? Is primarily by increase in serum threatening, uh, which we can by which we can estimate the glomerular filtration rate, or a urinary abnormality. The main important component is increase in protein in the urine, which is called as a proteinuria. so by means by labeling a person having kidney disease we should demonstrate either there is a decrease in glomerular filtration rate less than 60 ml and that we do by measuring serum threatening 
or there is a decrease, there is a significant increase in urine protein. Any one of these two components, if it is persistent for more than three months, then the patient is labeled as case of chronic kidney disease. Now, chronic kidney disease has doesn't develop in a, in a day or in a week's time. It has got a long course and depending upon the degree of fall in glomerular filtration rate, there are five stages of chronic kidney disease. Stage 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. And stage 5 is when the glomerular filtration rate is less than 15 ml per minute. And this is the stage which is labeled as end stage renal disease. And this is also a stage when medical treatment is not able to maintain the patient. And patient need renal refreshment therapy in the form of dialysis and or kidney transplantation. Now, if you see the awareness of uh, other non-communicable disease and compare with chronic kidney disease, then across the world, approximately 70% population is aware that they have got a high cholesterol. 80% patients uh, are, are aware that uh, they have got diabetes. But once it comes to chronic kidney disease, not more than 10% patients are actually aware of uh, uh, that they have got chronic kidney disease. And what is more important that although it is in percentage wise, it might be less than hyperlipidemia or diabetes, but it consumes 5% of the healthcare budget of any of the country. Now, this is uh, another slide which shows that in a multiple studies, it has been shown that approximately 60 to 90 percent uh, patients of chronic kidney disease are actually not aware of their disease and the diagnosis is made once we screen the patient by the test, the test same as serum creatine or proteinuria. So this is important that unless we screen the patient, this is another important slide. Currently in 2023, CKD in world is magnitude 850 million population. Mm -hmm. And the end stage renal disease, which is stage 5, is 85 million population. Now, this is magnitude, but what is important that the, the bar, bar is showing that approximately how many percentage of patients are actually not. This is differentiated with high income country, upper middle income country, low middle income country, and low income country. So now you can understand if we take India as a low middle income country and taking all other low middle of chronic kidney disease in the years to come. Uh, this is a study from uh, our own country of global burden of disease and this is uh, showing uh, data of 2017, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease as per the age. So there are two messages out of this uh, slide. Number one is that the magnitude of chronic kidney disease is higher in female than males. And number two, that with increasing age, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease is much more. So, for example, if we take age group of 75 to 90, the percentage, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease will be somewhere 36 to 40 percent. Now, uh, this is again global burden of disease data from India comparing magnitude of chronic kidney disease between 1990 to 2017. 
and you can see this is the color coded and i will only concentrate that the the red one is prevalent more than 10% and it is very obvious that in 1990 there were no area of the country which was colored with red but once we come to 2017 there are multiple areas which are red where the prevalence of ckd is more than 10% so the message is that comparing from 1990 to 2017 the magnitude of chronic kidney disease is increasing uh, across india in every state now this is a probably the most uh, planned study which is still not published uh, from indian council of medical research and this covers uh, seven cities of the country and uh, this has been completed but uh, yet to be published and what we did that we screened uh, 15000 patient uh, sub, uh, subject population in these seven country and the overall combined uh, magnitude of prevalence of ckd of all these seven uh, cities which represent india is 9.4% and which you can assess is very close to the data which is presented across the world from many other studies but one thing is further uh, more important by this slide that out of these seven cities the prevalence of ckd is not similar there are certain cities where it is much more for example jaipur it is 17% while in city of delhi it is 4.9% which means that if we plan to uh, pre uh, prevention of chronic kidney, kidney disease in india in different states there is a possibility that we may need to adopt the different strategies in different states now the next principle is that the diagnosis required is a is has got a suitable test and it is reasonably sensitive and specific for the disease now let's see where the ckd fits in now what is required we require few questions and measurement of the blood pressure for diagnosis of hypertension and then we require urine examination for testing of the protein which can be only simple qualitative by urine dipstick or it may be semi quantitative in estimation of proteinuria and we require a blood test for measurement of creatinine by which we can estimate globular filtration rate and in the while we are screening for ckd we also need blood sugar which can be done by sugar test and uh, because the diabetes is the commonest cause of chronic kidney disease so we need to include uh, blood sugar also along with serum test now this is the uh, uh, slide which is very important because once we were discussing the planning of uh, prevention of chronic kidney disease this is the data out of icmr study which i just quoted the two thing which i want to highlight in this is that uh, we need to do urine protein testing and a serum creatinine and uh, i wish to stress that at the moment at primary health center there is a lack of lecture ho rahi hai baad mein baat karunga for serum creatinine hello question was raised that can we hello. do by only doing urine proteinuria testing now this slide is showing The, and the urine protein is of 3 to 300 mg per day and this can be tested this is labeled as microalbuminuria and while a3 category which is severe proteinuria which is more than 300 mg per day is said to be over proteinuria now if we plan to do ckd screening at a primary health center level and apply only urine protein test and if we do microalbuminuria then we will be missing 32% patient of chronic kidney disease but if we do only dipstick proteinuria which estimates severe degree of proteinuria then we will be missing 76% of patient of ckd so the message is that if we plan to diagnose ckd we need to do both urine protein estimation as well as serum creatinine So we have to develop the methodology in such a way that we should be able to estimate serum creatinine at a primary health center level or a community health center level to diagnose all patient of CKD. Another important thing is that 
only measurement of the serum creatinine is not a good marker for assessing glomerular filtration rate, which defines the stages of chronic kidney failure. Now, here is the example if the serum creatinine is 1.3 and he is, uh, it is in 80 kg male, then we estimate glomerular filtration rate, it will be 90 ml. But same 1.3 creatinine, if it is in 40 kg female, then the GFR will be 45 ml. So, what is important that after measurement of serum creatinine, we should put a formula and estimate glomerular filtration rate. Otherwise, serum creatinine alone may be misleading to assess not only diagnosis of CKD, but the staging of CKD also, which is important. Now, so, we have seen that the test for diagnosis is quite simple. Now, let's see whether this test is acceptable to population or not, because once we are screening at a population field level, then the test should be acceptable to populations. Just to complete, uh, in one slide, we need to ask few questions. We need to do blood pressure measurement, urine deficit for quantitative measurement of protein, glucometer for fingerprint for estimation of sugar, and a serum creatinine. And all these tests can be done in a very small amount of money, somewhere rupees 100 to 200 will be sufficient to do the screening for chronic kidney disease. Now here, as we have got glucometer for measurement of a finger prick for blood sugar, there is a development of an instrument which is called creatinometer, which is also going to measure the serum creatinine by finger prick. Because we know that in the periphery field, finger prick uh, measurement of the test is much more acceptable as compared to withdrawing the blood from the vein through the syringe. But this creatinometer has still not in practice. So, with this, soon with time, the government and the policy makers should speed up and develop the creatinometer for easy acceptance of the test. Now, next uh, is that there should be a recognizably latent and asymptomatic period because if we diagnose the disease at the time of symptom, then we are quite late. So let's see where the CKD fits into this. As I told you, there are five stages of CKD. So stage one, two, and three are primarily asymptomatic stages. And what we clinically diagnose uh, CKD is majority of time is stage five and to some degree stage four. And if you see that how much is relative percentage of these stages, so, if you group stage 1, 2, and 3, these constitute 85 to 90 percent of all CKD, which means that 85 to 90 percent of CKD patients are asymptomatic and can be diagnosed only if we do the screening test of serum creatinine and urine protein. Now, next and then, then the next question is there should be accepted treatment for the patient with recognized disease. Now, whenever any screening for any disease is done, the, the most important question comes that if you diagnose that disease by the screening test, what next? Unless we are not able to give benefit to the patient by screening, then just screening is not a good uh, approach for prevention of disease. Now, if we diagnose the CKD at early stage of stage 1, 2, and 3, then these are the interventions which are possible. These are lifestyle modification, very good blood patient, uh, blood pressure control, glycemic control, and decrease in proteinuria by non-specific use of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor and SGLT2 inhibitor. These are SGLT2 inhibitor, the newer drug. And without uh, recognizing the cause of CKD, these two drugs can be used for decreasing the proteinuria, which is a one of the component of diagnosis of CKD. We can we also need to control the lipid and avoid nephrotoxic drug. And if the stage is stage late stage two or stage three, then the patient should be referred to nephrologist for long-term planning of the treatment of CKD. Now, what is the importance of uh, early diagnosis? 
Now, this is the slide which is showing that if you start the glomerular filtration rate from 100, and then at what is what time period patient will go into end stage disease. So, if if you are not uh, doing any treatment and patient is diagnosed at a symptomatic stage, then by seven years he might be in end stage renal disease. But if the uh, treatment is started early, but uh, is uh, is started but not early, then we can delay the need of dialysis by two years. Then he will require dialysis by nine years. But if we diagnose the patient at an early stage and do intervention, then we can delay the stage five to much more number of years. So that is the importance that if we diagnose early stage of CKD and do the treatment which I showed in the previous slide, we can delay the progression of chronic kidney disease for the need of dialysis or we may even prevent the patient reaching to that stage. And these are the general uh, advice of lifestyle modification, which I'm sure you are aware, which is applicable to almost all chronic kidney disease, chronic non-communicable diseases, which also include uh, chronic kidney disease. Now, another important question comes then once we are talking of a disease, chronic kidney disease, we also keep in mind there is a significant magnitude of acute kidney injury in the community. The hospital admitted patient, 20% of all hospital admitted patient will be having acute kidney injury. And in terms of chronic kidney disease, what is relevant that every acute kidney injury will further damage the degree of uh, chronic kidney disease. So if a patient of chronic kidney disease is developing multiple times acute <coughs> kidney injury interval, if progression of reaching to the stage 5 CKD will be shortened and he will start requiring dialysis or transplant much early. So, which means that a patient of chronic kidney disease should be prevented for getting a kidney injury also because this is one of the most potent factors for deteriorating the patient. Next thing is that do we, uh, for prevention of any disease, we should, we should know the natural history of that disease. Now, in terms of a natural history, chronic kidney disease is very well known in terms of natural history. It is a progressive disease. If a part of kidney is damaged and the patient is labeled as chronic kidney disease, it cannot be cured and there is a further progression of chronic kidney disease Unless, and this vicious cycle goes, unless patient reach to a end stage renal disease, when he needs dialysis and or transplant. So what is very definite that if correctly diagnosed as chronic kidney disease, we cannot cure it, but we can retard the progression of chronic kidney disease. And during that, so our aim is that we should retard progression of chronic kidney disease and during that treatment, patient should remain as best asymptomatic and should be able to lead his life useful for the society and the family. Depending upon the cause of chronic kidney disease, the rapidity of progression is different in different disease. So this we should also keep in mind while we are following a patient of chronic kidney. Now, in the course of chronic kidney disease, natural history, uh, natural history clearly says that a small degree of proteinuria or a minor decrease in glomerular filtration rate, these increases all cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality. And this effect is even with a very minor change in proteinuria or TFR. Another important thing in natural course of chronic kidney disease is that if you follow 100 patients of chronic kidney disease today, then 70 to 80 percent patient will actually succumb to cardiovascular and infective complications and will never reach to end stage. So out of 100 patients, it's only 20 percent patient which will ultimately reach to end stage kidney disease. So that is why every patient of chronic kidney disease, in addition to management of chronic kidney disease itself, 
all the treatment for prevention of cardiovascular complications should also be done to prevent the cardiovascular death in these patients. Then the cost of case finding of the disease in terms of a chronic kidney disease, this slide is actually comparing other non communicable disease and the cost involved. And if you see that the cost of the management of the chronic kidney disease is much more than the cost of treatment of hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. And if the patient is start requiring dialysis or transplant, then this cost multiplies significantly. So, treatment of chronic kidney disease is far more economically costly as compared to test for diagnosis of CKD early stage. The small number of patients actually get a regular treatment and this is the data from India that uh, two, two lakhs patients are required are getting dialysis and approximately 1500 this is a little old slide in 2022 1500 transplants and the last uh, aspect is case finding should be a continuous process this is not a one time screening of CKD now, CKD screening can be done either we do in whole population like it is being done in Singapore. They are trying to screen the whole population or there is a selected area like in India we know that the, there are selected area in southern states where the incidence of chronic kidney disease is much more. So, we can concentrate screening much more in that. But leaving behind, if you want to screen chronic kidney disease and prevent, then only the high risk group will be the most important target for screening of chronic kidney disease. And what is the high risk group? Every person, every patient of diabetes, every patient of hypertension, patient who has got family history of chronic kidney disease, patient person who has got more than 60 year age, any person who has got a past history of acute kidney injury, and as I told, a high prevalence area in the country, in southern state and in the in some of the eastern states where chronic kidney disease of unknown origin is very common. Other than these high risk group, any person who complains with swelling over the body, unexplained anemia, bone pain and fracture with a minimal trauma or a persistent nausea and vomiting. These are also, as these are very common and very, very subdued symptoms, we should not ignore and these patients should also be screened for chronic. In the last slide, I would like to stress that India has got the one-third delivery in India are actually low birth weight baby. And low birth weight baby in future in the adult has got a risk of development of a hypertension, diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease because their development of kidney leads to underdevelopment of kidney leads to low nephron number. And this child in the adulthood has got a high risk of chronic kidney disease. So, the government of India has integrated chronic kidney disease in national program of cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease and stroke. And it has been planned that what needs to be done at a primary center, what needs to be done in some sub-center and what facility needs to be developed at community health center. And there are guidelines also made for primary care physician for prevention, screening and management of the chronic kidney disease. And in the end, I will say that although we need to develop, we have got from a national organ transplant program, we have got uh, dialysis, EM dialysis program. But uh, as we know, we cannot handle every patient of these disease. We need to decrease the burden of chronic kidney disease itself. And this is the, my concluding slide. The CKD is an important public health problem. Diagnosis is very simple and cost effective, can be applied in a field setting. Large number of the patients are asymptomatic up to stage 3. Once diagnosed, treatment.
physical mobility and any government across the world cannot manage a, all patient of end stage renal disease so we must decrease the burden of chronic kidney disease by appropriate measures as being uh, planned and being developed by government of india thank you very much for your kind thank you agarwal sir uh very uh, uh, informative and very uh, 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 basically it was a learning for all i i must have sure that it will be a learning for all that to and the uh, the simple test by which we can detect and uh, also the we can prevent the progression of the ckd uh, and detection of the ckd and the lifestyle modifications which are required for prevention of the disease so very well covered by professor agarwal sir in his presentation so thank you sir for the uh, it will be it, it will be of immense benefit to all the, the people who are listening to this webinar so uh, i would now request archana dr archana to introduce the second speaker please yes. thank you sir and thank you dr sanjay agarwal sir for your informative talk i'm sure it will definitely help us it is always said that one must work for a cause and not a cause and today when we all have connected through this national webinar on organ and tissue donation and transplantation we all have a common target a task to accomplish that to raise awareness on organ and tissue donation and sensitize our key warriors our doctors nurses and medical students so that they further take the message of saving life to people and in organ donation i would like to uh, stress that the main or the important event is to declare brain stem cell declaration dr sandeep vaishya who is an executive director neurosurgery fortis vasant kunj and gurugram sir is to, uh, working on this for more than a decade now many of the awards and the publication is on his name so i would request dr sandeep vaishya to take the next session and sensitize our key values thank you dr shani <coughs> i'll just share my slides uh, If they have link, you can directly share. I am sharing my slide. Call me. Maybe I can call you. Maybe I can call you. Maybe you can call it. You may be thinking that we will upload. You can also upload from here. We have access. Sharing. 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 Can you hear? Can you hear? Sir, say something. No, I'm just saying. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah you're audible, sir, and you can see see the screen. Okay. So, so thanks for inviting me for the talk. and i just wanted to say that i am not working on it for last 10 years but for last 30 years and uh, actually i was the one who got the first heart donated which was done at ames so it has always been my passion uh, about organ donation and we still counsel a lot of patients and try to teach them and not only the patients the families the doctors medical students everywhere to to promote organ donation and the key thing to uh, donate organs is rightly said that firstly it has to be uh, the the brain death has to be identified and declared well in time sometimes there may be delay in declaring brain death by the time the patient's condition may become so bad that the uh, organ donation may become very challenging so not only we have to identify it well in time uh, to to discuss with the family and then prepare for the organ donation so it's a it requires a very coordinated team effort for this so i'll just uh, talk about a brief history that uh, in ancient times a person was considered dead if he stopped breathing uh, can you all close your microphone because i cannot hear my own voice uh, thank you so 
in ancient times a person was dead if he stopped breathing or decapitated or cut into half but in middle of 19th century the attention was turned towards the brain and the british law in late 19th century for the first time men mentioned that uh, death is complete cessation of all integrated functioning including mental and physical so in 1950s mechanical ventilators were invented and lot of patients who would have been dead otherwise started living for longer though many of them still died but lot of patients were able to survive for a very long time uh, but at that time there was no need of uh, any organ donation or such act because uh, the transplant technology was not there when in 1960s the transplant technology became popular so there was a surge in the demand of organs and lot of the particularly when the heart transplant came there was uh, demand of organs from a living donor living in the sense uh, uh, who was brain dead but uh, the heart was still beating so then there was a need for change of definition so that and that included the cessation of the neurological function so in 1960 year brain death uh, was defined for the first time by an ad hoc committee of the howard medical school in 1981 us president's commission recommended that the brain death should be seen as the death of the organism as a whole so they equated brain death with the death of the person so there were these of various definitions given by various academies and countries and societies and all equated brain death with uh, brain stem death or brain death with uh, death of the organism so the first brain death criteria were defined by the howard medical school and according to those criteria the patient should have been unresponsive and the temperature should have been more than 32.2 degree celsius patient should not be on any cns depressive drugs there should be no spontaneous movement patient should have apnea of respirator for at least 3 minutes there should be no brain stem reflexes including swallowing reflex gag reflex no eye movements there no deep tension jerks or no posturing of the patient and the eeg should be isoelectric the eeg is not a sacrosanct criteria these days but uh, i'm talking about the criteria defined at that time and then they repeat the entire examination after 24 hours so these were the first guidelines uh, which were made to declare the brain death of the patient but if you compare brain death with natural death in natural death with there will still be complete cessation of respiration and the heart function while brain death can occur only in very specific circumstances when the patient is in hospital and connected to a ventilator and heart is still beating and patient should have had a major cns event to cause that so now the main question is whether the brain dead are really dead or whether they can come back and that is the question in mind of everybody including doctors the family and the treating physicians so there was one of this early study uh, this is a national collaborative study to determine the cerebral death so they included 500 uh, 3 patients who who were comatose patients for more than 3 months and, and they studied these patients for more than 3 months and then the purpose of the study was to establish that the brain death criteria would predict non survival over time despite maximal care being given to the patient so all these patients were on ventilator and were treated to the maximum so of these 90% died within first 3 months when they reapplied howard brain death criteria to all these patients only 19 patients met the criteria and all patients died so this was the one of the earliest studies to prove that a person when he is properly declared brain dead all these patients will die and there is no chance of coming back so now we come to the emotional aspect of the brain dead so there was a study in 1995 and relatives uh, basically to see what the relatives of these patients thought so 20% of the families of brain dead patients continue to have doubts whether the relative was actually dead particularly because the heart is beating they can see the patient is passing urine the heart is beating the patient is on ventilator they, it appears as if the patient is breathing so that gives a sort of false impression and those 66% accepted that the patient was dead but still felt emotionally connected to the patient and that the patient was still alive so now these are the prejudices which we need to conquer and these are the group of people we need to educate uh, that the person uh, is brain dead once the person is brain dead that there is no chance of the patient coming back but for this we have to be absolutely sure that we do the brain brain stem death test properly and uh, by a recognized uh, group of people and uh, all the criteria should be applied should repeat the test and only once we are absolutely sure then we should talk about it
So the causes of brain death, the commonest cause would be a head injury, subarachnoid hemorrhage, a ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Uh, uh, the last one usually occurs in patients of drowning. Uh, well, head injury and subarachnoid hemorrhage are more often in younger age uh, group, and so they can be a potentially very good donors. So to diagnose uh, brain death, there are certain prerequisites. Firstly, there has to be an acute CNS catastrophe. There should be exclusion of certain medical condition. There should be exclusion of intoxication or poisoning. And the core temperature of the body should be more than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And there should be three cardinal findings in the patient. Patient should be comatose. There should be absence of brainstem reflexes. And there should be complete apnea. So, so these are certain uh, criteria which were uh, looked into to, to see whether they, they fulfill all the criteria for uh, brain death. So are there any patients who fulfill the criteria of brain death but recover brain function? The definite answer is no. So there has not been uh, any incidence where properly patient was certified brain death and the patient uh, came back to life. Now, what is the adequate observation period to ensure that the cessation of neurologic function is permanent? So there is insufficient evidence for that. But uh, generally, now the current guidelines for most of the countries say that you do the test. And if you certify brain death, you can repeat the test after six hours. And if the patient is still, uh, still fulfills all the criteria, then you can declare the person brain dead. So are there any complex motor movements which can falsely suggest that the patient may retain some brain function? Uh, yes, it is possible. Sometimes some patients, despite being declared brain dead, uh, they can have certain jerky movements, which is a sort of spinal reflex, but that doesn't really mean anything. So, but anybody who's testing should be, as I mentioned before, they should be very well versed in uh, applying all the criteria of brain dead and do the test properly. Now, another question is, what is the safety of apnea test? So when you're doing apnea test, you disconnect the ventilator and patient is not breathing for some time. So now the worry is that if the patient is not brain dead, are you going to make the patient worse by doing the apnea test? Yes, there is always a theoretical risk of that, but <clears throat> usually the apnea test is done when you are uh, particularly sure that all the other criteria are being met and the patient is brain dead. So are there any new ancillary tests for brain death? So there is insufficient data for that. So I will, <clears throat> I will tell you about the various ancillary tests which can be done in a doubtful situation. So now we'll come to how to check the brain's brain death. Firstly, uh, you apply painful stimulus to the supraorbital nerve or the nail bed to look for any motor response. If there is no motor eye response, uh, the test is positive. The pitfalls can be that uh, motor response during apnea test and during hypotension, there can be spinal, uh, spinal reflex. Secondly, neuromuscular blocking drugs can paralyze the muscle so that the, the test can be false positive. So one has to be sure that the patient is not on any neuromuscular blocking drugs. Again, these are brainstem reflexes, various brainstem reflexes. I will come to them one by one. Uh, so there should be absence of pupillary response in both the eyes. There should be ocular, uh, no ocular movement or oculocephalic or oculovestibular reflex testing. Corneal reflex should be absent and the pharyngeal and tracheal reflex should also be absent. So corneal reflex is elicited by touching the edge of the cornea. The if, uh, afferent is fifth term, the efferent is seventh term. A pitfall is that a severe facial or ocular trauma will close the eye because there will be swelling in the eye and that limits the interpretation. You may not be able to open the eye properly. And secondly, drugs like sedatives, barbiturate, and other drugs can abolish or diminish these reflexes. So the light reflex, uh, here the afferent is optic nerve and the efferent is third nerve. So there should be no re response to the bright light. There can, there may, the pupil may be round or oval and it, they can be mid-dilated mid, mid to fully dilated. Uh, the size really doesn't matter. It can range from four to nine millimeters, uh, but they are not reacting to light. The pitfall, again, many systemic drugs can change the pupil size. A local trauma, topical mydratics can also change the pupil size. Now, absence of grimacing or eye opening with deep pressure on both the contile. Again, this is also checking the pain reflex. So the afferent is fifth nerve and the efferent is seventh nerve. Then oculovestibular reflex. So you can look for the dolls eye movement, like, uh, like in the old days when you 
would move the doll, the eye, the doll would move the eyes on either side. So you turn the vigorous, uh, the head vigorously from middle position to 90 degree on both the sides, and you look for any eye movement. In a, uh, if the eye movement is not there, then the brainstem death is positive. Again, the pitfall is that if there is a concomitant spinal injury, then you don't move vigorously, and then perhaps you omit this test. Now, calorie test, here the head is elevated at 30 degrees uh, uh, from the ground. This is to isolate the input of horizontal semicircular canals. And then you continuously instill ice water, about 50 ml, uh, in the ear. And then you observe the patient's eyes up to one minute to look for any nystagmus. And after an interval of five minutes, you test on the other side. And there should be no tonic deviation of the eyes. Again, the pitfalls are like drugs can cause or dim uh, diminution or abolition of this reflex. There can be eye injury or edema, which can restrict the eye movement, and you may not be even able to open the eyes. If there is absent pharyngeal or tracheal reflex, uh, you can uh, elicit by touching the posterior pharyngeal wall by a suction cannula uh, through the tracheal tube, or you can directly press over the trachea from, the, um, from outside, so that can also elicit uh, this pharyngeal reflex. And sometimes it can be difficult to assess in an intubated patient. So for the apnea, there should be absence of breathing drive. So before doing the apnea test, there are certain uh, parameters which need to be fulfilled. So the prerequisite is that the core temperature should be more than 36.5 degrees centigrade. Systolic blood pressure should be more than 90 millimeters, and there should be positive fluid balance for six hours. So that is what I was saying initially, that um, if you suspect the person is brain dead, uh, then you should uh, you should be more proactive and try to do the test as early as possible, because once uh, the, the, these parameters start getting deranged, then the law doesn't allow us to do the test. So that becomes a catch-22 situation. Uh, if the PCO, PCO2 should be normal or more than 40 millimeters of mercury and uh, PO2 should be more than 200 millimeters of mercury. And then pre-oxygenate the patient uh, by 100% oxygen for 10 minutes. Then you disconnect the ventilator and deliver. Uh, and at the same time, you put a uh, oxygen catheter at the carina and continue to deliver oxygen in the nose. Then you look for uh, abdominal and chest fall movements for eight minutes. Now, when you are doing this, if there is no apnea, that means patient breathes. Uh, then, and if all other tests are positive, you wait and then you repeat this test after 24 hours. But if there is apnea, you do the air breath tests. If the PCO2 is less than 60, then you again check after five minutes. But if the PCO2 is more than uh, 60 or it increases by more than 20 than the baseline level, then the apnea test is confirmed. So here I'll show a short video of uh, doing various tests. So here we are uh, giving supraorbital pressure to look for any facial grimacing. Now, pupillary reflex is being checked by a bright light. So you check both the pupils and bring the light from the side. And then look for responses in both the eyes, whether the consensual or the uh, direct reflex is there. Now, uh, this is uh, touching the cornea from the side uh, to look for the corneal reflex. And as you can see here, the patient is not blinking, so the corneal reflex is uh, negative. Now, here you can directly apply pressure on the pharynx to, uh, on the trachea to, uh, to elicit the pharyngeal reflex, which was again negative. The patient did not cough. This is ice cold water and the uh, patient is already elevated by 30 degrees and you continuously instill the water into the ear and once you start instilling you open the eyes and look for any deviation of the eyes or any nystagmus now here you can see that even by continuous in installation of the ice cold water there is no movement of the eyeballs Now, this is checking for the doll's eye movement. You, you open the eyes and just turn the head uh, suddenly on either side. 
you can see that the eyes are fixed in the uh, central level. They are not moving on the either side. So again, this test is positive. Now the patient has already been pre-oxygenated for last 10 minutes. You can see that the uh, pulse rate is stable, the heart rate is stable, BP is all right, and the oxygen saturation is 99%. So you, you can proceed to disconnect the ventilator. Remove the clothes from the upper half of the body to bear the chest and the abdomen and look for any movement in the chest or abdominal wall. Again, you see that there is no movement, so the apnea test is positive. You do it for, we, we do it for minimum five minutes, but the various guidelines say ranging from five to eight minutes. And uh, then if uh, once it is negative, then you, uh, you connect the patient back to the ventilator. So the ancillary tests, they are not required for routine cases. There can be previously conventional angiography used to be done, but it's an invasive test and a time consuming test. Uh, but uh, it still can be done in, an, uh, in a position of doubt. Then you can do an EEG, you can do transcranial Doppler, you can do a technetium brain scan, you can do uh, somatosensory evoked potential or brainstem auditory evoked responses, or you can do a spec CT. So this is a conventional angiography. On this side, you can see this is normal. This is the internal carotid artery, and this is the intracranial filling of the blood vessels. While in a brain dead patient, there is no intracranial flow. So you can compare these two, uh, that they, you can see multiple vessels here, while there is complete absence of vessels here. Uh, this is a normal EEG, where you can see uh, multiple waves. While in the, this brain dead patient, there is an electrocerebral silence. Again, in the EEG, uh, that artifacts can limit interpretation and the sedatives and barbiturates can cause isoelectric EEG. So you can, uh, you have to be sure that patient is not on any of those drugs. Again, this is an example of a transcranial Doppler. Uh, there is a systolic wave and there's a diastolic wave. Uh, while in a brain dead patient, you can see small systolic peaks in early systolic, but there is no diastolic wave. Uh, now cerebral scintigraph done by Technetium 99. So it is injected within 30 minutes of reconstitution and you take multiple images and there is no uptake in the brain parenchyma. It looks like a hollow skull. Uh, you can see here, like the rest of the body is getting filled by it, but the skull remains hollow. So it is complete absence of Technetium uptake in this skull. So again, in somatosensory evoked uh, responses, there is bilateral absence of N20 and P23 response. I'm just showing this that these tests can be done. It's not actually that we do all these tests. And there can be certain neurologic states that can mimic brain death, like locked in syndrome, akinetic mutism, a person vegetative state. In most of these states, uh, there, there will not be any dilemma because the patient is still breathing. But in very few cases where the patient stops breathing, and uh, so there can be uh, a doubt about this, particularly in severe hypothermia or sedative or anesthetic overdose, uh, or they can lead to a uh, neuromuscular paralysis. So you have to be very careful before diagnosing brain death that patient is not in any of these situations. Now, coming to declaration of brain death in children less than uh, two years of age, uh, less than one year of age, the brains in, in uh, infants have increased resistance to damage and they may recover substantial function even after exhibiting unresponsiveness for a prolonged period as compared to adults. So, so longer periods of observation are required in small children. They should not be significantly hypothermic or hypotensive for the age. And the recommended observation period depends on the age of the patient. It is, if, if we assume that the child was born at full term, between the ages of two months and one year, an interval of at least 24 hours should be used as compared to six hours in the adults. While between the ages of seven days and two months, a minimum interval should be 48 hours. For children less than seven days of age, uh, no reliable criteria have been established till now. And in patients from seven days to two months, two examinations and EEGs should be separated by at least 48 hours. While in uh, two months to one year, two examination the EEG should be separated by at least 24 hours. And so why we want to declare a person brain dead early? 
Firstly, to save valuable resources. And secondly, to promote organ donation. Now, as far as resources are concerned, when a person is brain dead, you know that this patient is not going to come back. While we, at the same time, if the patient has had infections, uh, we will continue with uh, high-end antibiotics, patient will be on ventilator. And in our country, when there is still dearth of beds, so a patient who is brain dead and if he's occupying that bed and, occupying, uh, and using all the resources which can be utilized for any other patient who actually needs a ventilator in that bed. So in that way, we can save valuable resources. Secondly, if we declare the person brain dead and if we can educate the family about the brain death and the uh, futility of uh, doing any uh, further uh, intervention and uh, to continue with life, and if we are if they are able to understand that, then we can uh, we can promote more organ donations. So this is I'll just withdraw all of life. So this is the these were the criteria to di diagnose brain death. So there initially it was a neurologist or a neurosurgeon and two physicians. One of them should be a treating physician, a medical admin of the hospital, an intensivist or anesthetist. None of them have anything to do with the transplant. It must be done twice with a minimum gap of six hours. And it used to be that it can be declared only institutions recognized by appropriate state authority. But in amended law, a neurologist or neurosurgeon is not necessary, particularly in small towns, they may not be available and it can be substituted by a physician. And hospitals other than institution can be licensed for organ retrieval or transplant. Brain, uh, there should be a brain death committee in the hospitals and it is a physician's duty to identify brain death, inform the brain death committee and then register all the brain death patients. Thank you. Is there any question? Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, uh, sir. Uh, our DGHS, like who could not join at the beginning of the uh, uh, of the webinar because of uh, some urgent engagement, uh, he is the chairperson for this webinar, Professor Atul Goyal, sir. Uh, he is now available. We are uh, thankful to him, sir, for taking time and uh, joining the webinar. So we we'll request him to give his message on the occasion of this national webinar, which is being not only telecast on the two YouTube channels, with one of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and also of NOTO, and uh, through the webinar also around two more than uh, 200 persons have joined. Moreover, this webinar is being uh, 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 also uh, telecast by various uh, medical colleges, institutions of national importance like SMS Jaipur uh, in uh, PGI Chandigarh, James Noida and in uh, JNK, so to, uh, Government Medical College JNK and so these are uh, and many, many others. So, so this is going to many of the uh, people uh, who are medical medical nursing and paramedical professionals as well as other stakeholders for uh, for promoting the cause of organ donation and for prevention of diseases so i would request our dghs sir to give his remarks uh, and his uh, his remarks and message for the on the occasion of this national event thank you sir. Uh, very good morning uh, Apologies for not joining earlier. There was no pressing engagement. Actually, I attend my outpatient uh, clinic on Saturday. 
and get to see a few patients, which is uh, so very dear to me. So after seeing those patients, I am here at 11 o'clock. And as for seeing the topics of the webinar, since uh, two of the topics focus on prevention of uh, renal failure and hepatic disease. So I would just uh, mention the three patients that I saw in the OPD today. And I will bring to you certain points which we must consider when we talk of prevention of uh, these organ failures. The first patient I saw was a 72 year old diabetic who I first saw two weeks back. And at that time she was on four antihypertensive drugs. A dose of telmesartan 40 mg twice a day, amlodipine uh, 5 mg twice a day, etinolol 50 mg once a day, and prazosine 2.5 mg HS. The BP last time when I saw her was about 100 by 60. Apart from this, she was on two antidiabetics, metformin and boglicose, and she had an HbA1c of 5. She was on pantoprazole. Pantoprazole today is part of every prescription. In fact, all three patients I saw, pantoprazole was part of prescription. Then she was on a multivitamin and an antioxidant. So she was taking 5, 4, 9, approximately 9 to 10 medications. You see, on the one hand, we talk of organ damage. On the other hand, we don't realize the potential of the allopathic medicine causing organ damage. So that time I reduced her antihypertensive to telmisartan 20 mg OD along with the amlodipine 5 mg OD. Reduced her metformin to a single dose and uh, just stopped all other medications. This time when she came, the BP was still 110 by 70. But her heart rate had increased to about 110. So I put her on just amlodipine and a small dose of bezoprolol along with the metformin and I sent her back. Now what I'm trying to put across is that one, we don't even realize what is the anti-diabetic level to be achieved. You see, she had a HbA1c of 5. At 72 years, HbA1c of 7, 7.5 is very well acceptable. So unnecessary drugs, maybe next time I am able to stop her metformin as well. She may not even require that. Now coming to the second patient is, uh, is a 40 year old NTS worker who, whose complaint was pain abdomen, distension and flatulence for the last about one and a half year. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Hapimete, he was seen in the AIMS OPD four uh, weeks back, in the medical OPD of AIMS four weeks back, where he was, he says, he claims my abdomen was not examined. My history was heard very briefly. And I was prescribed four drugs. He carried the prescription. Usme sabse pehli drug pantoprazole thi. Dusri ek antacid tha. Phir isabugol tha. Ek antioxidant tha. Ek multivitamin tha. Iske alawa ek chhati drug jo apne aap chemist se kharid ke kara tha. Woh famosid thi. Famotidine. To usne maa doctor se puchha ki kya mein ye le sata hoon ke tu meko isko relief, isse relief aja ta hai. To doctor ne ka ye bhi le lena. Jak kabhi mokha pade. So, I have a history of history. Li, badi interesting history li. See, he was consuming 18 chapatis a day. In one meal, he used to take six chapatis and he used to finish those six chapatis in less than 10 minutes. A big basic learning is that when you are in the air, you suck in a lot of air. When you are in the air, at least 50 to 60 percent of your stomach, mein jati hai, which is going to escape as flatulence. Gas formation ho, that is going to escape. So, I have to go to the goal. I have to go to the goal. And uh, I got a precautionary ECG because a 40 year old man who complains of distension and pain abdomen should always be investigated for IHD. Now, again, we have to go to the goal. We have to We have to go to the goal. We have to So, modern medicine is probably losing its way by prescribing too much, which is not required. Now coming to the third patient, a 48-year-old obese lady diagnosed hypertensive, diabetic and hypothyroid. She had a problem, but she was on thyroxine 75 microgram for the last couple of years with not a single test of thyroid being done. Achha, our tendency kya hai? Hum thyroid test jab karte hai, follow up patients, mein, we do only the TSH. Agar TSH humara 5 se 1.2.2 hai, 25 microgram thyroxine aur bada dete hai. This is what is happening. And if People who are uh, familiar with medicine should know that when thyroid storm hoti hai, you actually have liver failure. So is excessive dose of thyron, thyroxine, can it also result in hepatic dysfunction? I believe it can. When it can be the manifestation of uh, thyrotoxicosis or it can be the manifestation of a thyroid storm, 
why can't it cause liver failure anyway ek taraf uska heart she has got a heart disease dusri taraf aap thyroxin badhaye ja rahe ho if we remember the dose of thyroxin it is uh, in terms of micrograms and the maximum dose should be about 100 micrograms agar hum normal body weight ko le lekin aajkal people are on 200 to 250 micrograms of thyroxin and not responding so there is something wrong somewhere which we need to investigate so mindlessly nahi banana hai please get a t3 t4 done along with tsh only if the t3 t4 is less to increase the thyroxin otherwise don't blindly increase it so these are certain messages which should go in terms of practice of medicine to prevent organ failures and uh, i am sure all the people here would take care because aap jitne marzi transplants kar lo jitni population hamari india ki hai we can never solve the problem of organ failures by increasing the number of transplants we will have to ultimately reduce the number of organ failures to take care of these this gap so i will end here and hope you have a good webinar i will also take leave because i have now some urgent matters to attend to so we end here thank you thank you sir thank you very much and giving the message that we should focus on prevention of disease and do not prescribe the unnecessary medicines to and because that is our primary duty that we should not cause no harm to our patients by our uh, treatment prescriptions so that is very important that we should have rational pre prescription what is required that should be given so uh, i would now request dr ashna to introduce the next speaker and we will have thank you sir throughout this webinar we will have the privilege of hearing from steam experts in the field of organ transplantation and donation the experiences and insights will undoubtedly open our minds and heart to the profound impact of this life saving gift so we'll move to our next session and i would re uh, request dr rahul pandit who is a consultant intensivist uh, uh, chief uh, intensivist in hn reliance so he is working uh, uh, on donor management for past decade and he is uh, uh, giving a vital uh, playing a vital role in this so i would request dr rahul pandit to take the next session disease donor management thank you very much uh, madam for the fine introduction uh, anil kumar sir good, uh, good morning thank you very much and honorable uh, dj sir good morning uh, can i share my slide or they you will be sharing it from your side madam You can share that. You can share. You can share. I can share. Thank you. Doing that now. Is it visible to everyone? Yes, yeah, it is visible, sir. Thank you, sir. You can make it on slide. Yeah, I'm just doing that. Sir. Yes. So, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, webinar. I'm going to talk about uh, management of a brain dead donor. Uh, after the talk on uh, how to diagnose brain dead, I think this is an apt talk to actually follow. so that we understand that uh, how do we preserve these organs so that uh, organ donation can happen and if it, if at all organ donation happens these organs should be in the best of the shape so that they can actually benefit for the purpose of which organ donation work that's the whole purpose of managing a brain donor now when do you actually identify a donor that's the most important thing the first thing which we actually need to identify and understand is that if you wait for all the reflexes to go away and then act and then start thinking of preserving this donor then you are a little bit too late i can also hear a echo some people are complaining of echo um even i can hear that echo yes i will try and see if i can come off my ear plugs and just go back to normal let me give me a second Sir, madam. So you can try now. Hello. Yeah. Is it still it's happening? happening? It's still happening. Oh, it's better here. Speakers. We we'll just check, sir. Sometimes. <laughs> So can we do the presentation full screen as people are saying we are not able to do it? It is full screen. Host can't be able to show. That cannot be. It is full screen.
अच्छी उसको फुल स्क्रीन थोड़ा बड़ा उसमें इलाज करें रिफ्लेक्सिसमेंटली that is the time when you actually lost a lot of important uh, uh, time for managing his donors so i have come out with this mnemonic which is a very acceptable mnemonic uh, worldwide which is give if you have any patient which has got a gcs of less than 5 is unconscious or is is intubated needs full ventilator support and the eye signs are absent or they are already abnormal those are the patients you need to identify and they need to be basically started to be preserved so that if at all they put or go on to become brain dead you have already preserved these patients reasonably well if you wait for the reflexes to sort of go away i think you are too late again i'm just repeating myself the general approach to these issues is basically a good housekeeping your standard approach to the issues is, is very important maintain extracranial lung perfusion prevent and post sequelae of brain death correct and normal physiology as necessary to facilitate a clinical brain death testing exclude contraindications to brain death determination which is which will be covered as we go across not in my talk but in other talks and consult your local organ donation agency at any time like noto roto or soto um, or your ztcc or your transtan whichever state you are in so that they will be able to help you out Now there is an important thing to understand. The entire physiology is is a bit different before the patient becomes brain dead. The entire therapy is oriented towards brain. So we try to maintain our cerebral perfusion pressure. You try to maintain. So can we not get anything to do with the echo? And from my side, I'm just on a normal computer with my headphone. That's all. With my AirPod, rather. Is there any other person who has the uh, webinar open on their their computer? Please stop it. Please mute it, or please disconnect. Then we'll be able to hear it properly. Hello. Is it better now? Hello. Yeah, much better. Much better. Rahul Jain sir, please mute your please please mute your uh, pro, uh, your computer. Thank you, thank you very much. Now that's much better. So physiological support before brain death. Brain basically your therapy is oriented towards preserving the brain. So we are managing these patients, trying to maintain their CPP, trying to save their life. We give them osmotherapy. We control the temperature. Sometimes there is a mild hypothermia which is contained. Uh, CSF drainage is done sometimes, and we keep on assessing the. Uh, the CNS functions. Unfortunately, despite best of the ability, these patients go across and lose all their CNS activity. That's when we actually talk about brainstem death, and that's when we need to think of withdrawal of brain-oriented therapy. Once you've done your first test, and once you've done your uh, uh, done your first clinical uh, apnea test, then you can stop all of these brain-oriented therapies completely. So, what is the physiology after brain death? Basically, it is to preserve the organs. so that uh, the purpose of organ donation is is fulfilled so that the organs which we are actually donating can function very well in the donor in the recipient's body for which they are going through how do we do it we have authored iiccm donor management guidelines and i can tell you today that on the 8th, on the 15th of july we had our second meeting and this is 5 years old guidelines so the new guidelines are now be prepared within one month they will be ready and they will be published in the indian journal of critical care medicine again so we are again in the so in the in the position to say to publish these guidelines back again with a with a renewed evidence and everything and what i am going to cover today is going to be a part of the lot of new evidence which we are talking about um we are going to talk about ventilating these patients how to manage fluids and inotropes uh, dd avp warming we are going to talk about uh, basic treatments for critically ill patients like turns suctioning surveillance and we will talk about monitoring and investigations so this is the paper which i am referring to 2017 as i said the next paper will be out 
before the end of this year and it will be available in the Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine. So once the donor is identified, I think there are some basic cardinal rules which we need to follow. The first is you measure the temperature. So always measure the pore temperature. A lot of the times I find that uh, people who are managing these donors, they, uh, they believe that they are managing the temperature quite efficiently. But unfortunately, they are doing the surface temperature monitoring. And 90% of the problems I have been able to solve by just asking them to do a core temperature monitoring. And usually the core temperature is much, much lower. What happens is that the donor, once they become brain dead, they do not have the ability to uh, keep their body warm. So they quickly cool down to the room ambient temperature. And it's not uncommon to have a temperature of 30 degrees, 29, 29 degrees, 31 degrees, 32 degrees with severe hemodynamic compromise, sometimes even cardiac arrest. So please measure your core temperature because one of the requirements or prerequisites of brain dead testing is a normal core temperature, which should be at least 35.5 degrees centigrade or more. The second is after the first test is positive, please stop your mannitol, phenytoin and all the other things which you are trying to be brain protective so that you do not induce large volume diuresis again and further cause more uh, hypothermia and stuff. I go by the rule of 100. What is rule of 100? Rule of 100 is simple. Try and maintain a patient's blood pressure of 100 millimeter systolic, urine output around 100 ml per hour, temperature closer to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 98.97 and above, um, and of course below 100. As every 100 minute passes, you assess volume, whatever status in which you are assessing volume in your unit. Whether you are using a CVP, you are using your IBC method or you are using a stroke volume variation, please use it effectively. Monitor sodium and potassium every 100 to 200 minutes and make sure that you are, rep uh, you are basically replacing the requirements or you are correcting the sodium as required. And nowadays, the first choice of vasopressor is vasopressin, not, not uh, noradrenaline or dopamine. Dopamine certainly is an erythmogenic drug. Vasopressin basically acts in two ways. It helps us to sort of uh, decrease the, uh, the diabetes insipidus and conserve the water. And secondly, it has a very good, uh, very good uh, vasopressor effect, which actually helps us to maintain the blood pressure quite well. So nowadays, we start with vasopressin first, and then we go across and talk about um, adding noradrenaline if at all required. <clears throat> So let's, uh, let's go to specific issues, respiratory care. So when I have a patient, the problem which occurs with many of these patients becoming unstable is that we do not treat them like normal patients in our unit. We actually treat them as patients who are waiting for organ donation or who are waiting for a brain dead testing to be happening. And there's a certain amount of uh, care which goes down with these patients. So routine suctioning, position changing, turning, ventilator require requirements to be adjusted like PEEP or recruitment maneuvers and avoidance of interstitial fluid overload so that you actually optimize their as oxygenation or oxygen delivery to the, to the tissues is very, very important. So we need to continue doing things as you would normally do for normal patients. And such a such a approach is very, very vital, especially if you are going to go and have a lung donation with that donor. If you do not keep the lungs very well, you will actually find difficulties not only in apnea testing, but you'll also find that the lung may not be useful and the lung may be rejected out, where you could have easily conserved the lung a little bit better by having your uh, having your fluid and, and uh, ventilatory management done in the medical Now, circulation becomes a big problem. In the initial stages, when the patient is coning, you have an autonomic storm. It is usually transient, but a lot of people lose their nerve at that time and add on long-acting agents. My suggestion would be that do not tax long-acting agents. Use short-acting agents like Esmolol or sodium nitroprusside, which can be quickly titrated and stopped, and you'll be able to have a reasonable amount of hemodynamic stability with that. Arrhythmias in form of tachycardias are common. My, again, the humble suggestion is every 100 to 200 minutes, do a ABG so that you have electrolytes and everything in your hand. Keep on doing your volume assessment. Look at the temperature and see if you're adding any drug, any arrhythmogenic drug, which may be causing any problem. If the patient progresses on to have a bradycardia, it is often seen that they are resistant to atropine. So, in fact, I would actually give them a diluted adrenaline, one in 100,000, uh, given, uh, given as, a, as a bolus of 2 or 3 ml. What we do is we have the one in 1,000, uh, we dilute that 
to one in ten thousand. Sorry, not in one in hundred thousand. One in ten thousand. Beg your pardon. And then we keep on giving uh, giving a diluted form of that in one one two two mil till the heart rate picks up at times when they become bradycardic. And if the patient has had a first apnea test done, which was positive, and they go into a cardiac arrest, please do a CPR because you must still have a good recovery of the cardiac function and a successful transplant in these patients. If they have not had their first test, then it becomes a little bit of an ethical dilemma. I would still go across and do a CPR because I still don't know what is happening. Uh, but uh, some people have uh, a different view. This is not an ethics talk, so I'm not going to go into the ethical aspect of that. I think let's just continue with managing a specific issue. Now, hypovolemia. A lot of the time, volume status is left out to be to be understood till the very last when the sodium climbs up to 170, 180. And then we say that the sodium rise is actually an effect, not the cause of brain death. And we agree that it is an effect of the brain death. But that doesn't mean that we do not attempt to correct the volume and bring down the sodium to as normal as we can. I would say that anybody in any unit if the sodium goes above 155, it is actually the incompetence of that unit in managing that patient. I am very clear. I am using a very uh, uh, word with a lot of responsibility because that means that you have not paid attention to the patient. You have not understood the physiology. If you would have understood the physiology, you would not have allowed the sodium to go beyond 160, 150, 155. Maybe I can extend it to 160, but anything beyond that really, that means you have not paid attention. Complete requirement of optimization of, of these patients is required. Fluid strategy, strategy might, be required, may, might be necessary. You may have to give large volumes of uh, water through the nasogastric tube or free fluid through being given through the nasogastric tube. 5% dextrose or liter of fluid sometimes is very, very necessary to complete the volume replacement as well as bring the sodium down. Remember, this sodium is the effect, not the cause of brain death. So, correcting that sodium rapidly does not actually have any problem. But... To fulfill the criteria of having a physiology as normal as possible is one of the things which is very, very, is a cornerstone of the management of these patients. So make sure that we bring the sodium down and correct the potassium if required. If these patients have got a persistent uh, hypotension despite your vasopressors and vasopressin, then please uh, have a look at the echo of the heart. Because usually these patients will anyways have it. If they have a low cardiac output status or a poor rejection fraction, some of these patients may require a few more therapies in the form of your uh, hormonal therapy, and I'm going to come to that. Optimize their volume. Keep a mean arterial pressure of around 65 to 70 millimeters of mercury. 90% um, of our brain dead patients require inotropic support, not all of them. As I said, vasopressin of one unit or two units per hour is our first choice. And then almost 90% of them still need norepinephrine to support that. And I think that's what we should be doing. Hormonal resuscitation, if despite your best of the ability, if the patient does not have an improvement in the blood pressure, then there is some evidence, level 2 evidence to suggest that we should be using a couple of hormones to be replaced because remember, the pituitary gland is also not functioning well. So, there is a recommendation to give the to give T4, now sorry, T3. Now, unfortunately, we do not have the intravenous form. So, what we do is we just give a stat dose of thyroxine 300 micrograms through the nasogastric tube and hope that it actually absorbs well. I think that's a very reasonable therapy to do in our setting right now. Methylprednisolone in form of 15 milligram per kilogram bolus or 1 gram can be given just as a stat. Some people are using the sepsis dose of 100 milligrams of, uh, of hydrocortisone VD or 50 QID, which is also fine. But if you are actually going in for a lung transplant, please give this patient methylprednisolone because the lung donation have shown to have some amount of improvement in the graft uptake. If at all, we give this patient 15 milligrams of uh, kilogram of methylprednisolone. Diabetes insipidus, it is best avoided if you can actually quickly identify that your patient is going into DI and start vasopressin. You will be able to actually stop the volume loss quite effectively. Replace the volume. The two drugs which are used are DDAVP, which is desmopressin or vasopressin. Desmopressin nasal spray again becomes a little, of a little bit of a problem because you don't know how much dose you are giving exactly, whether you are actually uh, puffing it into the nose correctly or not. IV vasopressin serves the same purpose. And I think that should be your first choice of medicine to be given for that. Metabolically, with the volume loss, these patients lose a lot of potassium and have their increase in the sodium. So please make sure that you replace these electrolytes uh, correctly. Insulin can be given to maintain the blood glucose in the normal range. Our normal range now is 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. That is what our NICE trial has shown. 
that uh, nice sugar trial which was done that this is the sugar range which actually maintains the patient quite norm optimal you do not need to have a tight glucose control over one from below 140 millimeter milligrams per deciliter so 140 to 180 is the range unfortunately hypothermia is very difficult to correct if it sets in and your core temperature is below 35 trust me despite best of your warming efforts this of this of best of your warming effort by giving iv fluids or blankets or warmers you may feel that the temperature does not rise beyond 0.5 degrees centigrade per hour or maybe 1 degree centigrade per hour. So if you have a patient who is hypothermic by 3 or 4 degrees centigrade, you are basically going to rewarm that patient over the next 3 to 4 hours. And as they rewarm, they will vasodilate and become further hemodynamically unstable. Just last couple of slides and I'll be done. There is some overview of specific issues. Anemia and coagulopathy, we see very often. Please do not neglect it. Correct it as you may require to correct it. Uh, if you require to give blood products, please use them correctly. If you require to correct the anemia, try and clip the hemoglobin at least 7 milligrams per deciliter, 7 grams per deciliter. And, and make sure that if the patient is having some form of coagulopathy, it is corrected quickly as well as the donation happens very quickly as well. We always encourage to continue enteral feeding. There may be a bit of a challenge because these patients do have a bit of gastric stasis. But use of prokinetics to help the enteral feeding might be a good way to actually continue with the gut flora. As well as the more important thing here is that it actually makes sure that if your patient is going in for an intestinal transplant, this patient may have a gut which would be functioning reasonably well. Now, neuromuscular blocking agents. If you have a very, very bad patient, uh, who have very, a patient who has got a very bad uh, uh, spinal reflexes, then after completion of both the test and just before the patient is in wheel to the operation theater, it might be necessary to give them a one dose of neuromuscular blocking agent just to avoid that unpeaceful, un, un, uh, you know, pleasant actions being seen by the patient's hands or legs being moved while the patient is being actually moved to the operation theater. And even for the operating team, it becomes very, very uncomfortable to see a patient's hand or leg move as a part of a spinal reflex. That's just something which we need to do. So, you know, few things in the theater, whatever monitoring is going on in the ICU, please continue that in the operation theater as well. Make sure you've got blood products available. Your ventilatory and circulatory parameters should be maintained. Your neuromuscular blocking agent should be given during the surgical time. Sympathetic responses could happen and could result in myocardial injury and exacerbated bleeding. So even opioids might be necessary and opioids may be given to suppress the catecholamine-mediated sympathetic activity. Now, some specific problems. Uh, severe oxygenation failure. Do what you would normally do, including prone ventilation, spinal reflexes. Please uh, take care of the spinal reflexes. Talk to the family. Make sure that they are aware that what spinal reflexes are. And when the patient is going to theater, do not uh, be afraid to give them neuromuscular blocking agent for, for the patients who have spinal reflexes. If they don't have spinal reflexes, I would not advocate that to be given. Some reassurance. Last slide. Do what you do and you will do it well. Maintain a good vigil. Approach the problem systematically and with system. Most problems are amenable to solution. And at any time, I am happy to be contacted from anywhere in the country if there is any problem and we'll be happy to, happy to help you with the donor management. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions. Sir, thank you, Dr. Rahul Pandit, sir. Uh, Thank you so much for this enlightening talk and uh, because we know that disease donor management is a big issue and, and it is also the uh, one of the key parameters which any ICU should adhere to for, uh, uh, and, uh, for not only for organ donation but it also indicates the quality of care in that ICU. If we are able to maintain the deceased donor in the best of the physiological uh, conditions and so that they remain fit and, you know, the, the, and that, that in many centers this requirement is the, the, the deceased donor management is not poor and thank you for offering all your help to anyone in the country and uh, with such open heart we are uh, really great. Uh, to hear those words from you and uh, uh, and definitely as many of these developed countries they are maintaining their disease donors uh, in the best of the future we should be able to maintain uh, with a hundred percent accuracy uh, as per the protocols uh, 
and which so has to have uh, the successful not only organ donation but uh, 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 and able to save lives. So, so this is very important. And thank you for this talk. Very important talk from all the uh, 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 for promotion of organ donation in the country. Uh, Dr. Abdesh, you wanted to ask a question? Yes. Yeah, Dr. Abdesh, uh, who is uh, uh, CMO NFSG in NOTO, and he would be uh, he's asking a question. Yeah. Sure, sir. Sir, uh, thanks for your uh, enlightening uh, lecture. Sir, uh, you have mentioned that CPR can be tried after first apnea. There is a grey zone where a lot of uh, intensivists and uh, ICU people humble whether to attempt for CPR or not. Can you elaborate it further, sir, for the better benefit of mass and uh, yes, all the yes, intensives? Yes, 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 sure, Bhikram. Uh, sir, uh, the, what happens is that uh, sometimes, unfortunately, despite best of the efforts, these patients will become hemodynamic and they will go into cardiac arrest. And the first test is done. Essentially, you have more or less confirmed that this patient is brain dead. Okay, and if there is if there is a cardiac arrest between the first and second test, I would definitely go ahead and do a CPR. I would have no ethical dilemma. In my mind. I would stabilize the patient and do the second test, perhaps not in six hours, but wait till the patient becomes again hemodynamically stable. Maybe extend that six hours to eight hours, ten hours, twenty-four hours sometimes and do the second test. The ethical dilemma, sir, is that if before the first test, again somebody has uh, switched on the please mute your mic, sir. Somebody else is is, uh, is having their speaker on. Rahul Jain, sir, can you please mute your mute your mic, sir? Rahul, it is giving echo again. Rahul Jain, sir, please mute your mic. Thank you. So now it's better. So if the the dilemma ethical dilemma happens if the patient has got a very poor neurological outcome, which we know. And before the first test, they go into a cardiac arrest. Then the intensivist and the neurologist and the physician start having thought process that anyways he's gone into cardiac arrest. Will I be able to do a first apnea test or not? Hemodynamics would maintain or not? And in that, they sometimes do not do a lot of aggression CPR and let the patient go away. Now, this is a very different scenario, sir. Between the first and second test or after the second test, please do CPR. Before the second test, there is some ethics because you've not got consent. You do not know whether the patient will go for donation or not. I think you have to take it case by case. If there is a feeling that the family may be able to comprehend with, uh, the, with the concept of organ donation, then please do CPR, stabilize the patient, and then you basically go across and do your, uh, do your brain dead test testing after the patient becomes hemodynamically stable. So there should not be any hesitation in giving CPR between the two tests or after the second test, awaiting organ donation. So one more aspect of that, nowadays with DCD, DCD being a possibility, um, again, even with hemodynamically unstable patients, we are sort of coming out with the paper where we are talking about uh, DCD, how it can be done, and it's under the ages of NOTO only. Uh, so I think that will become even better now, and we might be able to withdraw the care. Uh, I've had some discussions with Anil Kumar, sir, informally on some WhatsApp groups about it. Uh, we all have our thoughts, but trust me, we all support the whole process. We all support the whole process. There is just ethics and uh, and dilemmas which we need to clear off from people who are going to support us. See, there is no problem in talking to us because we are already converted. We know we want to support this program. The problem is with the general people, general intensive care people who need to be sort of taught to support this program. Question from the chat in the chat box that how do we check temperature by that method as core temperature is given much emphasis. Yes. So this yes. is what is written. So, so uh, there is a Dr. Ram Mohan. Yeah. Yeah. So there are monitors uh, nowadays, the cardiac monitors which are there in ICU. Most of the monitors will have a provision for a, a temperature module to be attached. Uh, if you are in a very rural place, you might find it challenging. In that case, uh, it might be a difficult one to do a rectal temperature if you don't, if your monitor does not support it. Um, I do not support the use of putting a mercury thermometer in the rectum. It is not something which is advisable because it can cause more harm than good. But certainly probes are available which can be put either rectally or esophageal probes are available. 
which can be used and they will give you a very accurate core temperature. If your monitor doesn't support it, then please use axillary temperature or sometimes the oral temperature kept below the tongue with a very careful monitoring of the patient uh, is, is something which can be done. These are the two ways in which you can manage the temperature. So, thank you so much sir. Uh, thank you for this enlightening talk. I, I, I'm sure it will be a, a very highly beneficial to all the people who are involved in critical care uh, uh, and anesthetic care for these patients in the intensive care. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please, uh, Dr. Ashton, please introduce the next speaker. Moving ahead, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Akash Shukla, Professor Akash Shukla, Professor and Head Gastroenterology, State GS Medical College, KEM Hospital, uh, to speak about uh, prevention of liver disease, which is the most burning topic of today's uh, lifestyle, as we have a lot of burden on our uh, medical field in the liver diseases. So, Dr. Akash Shukla. Uh, sir, would you me? share your presentation from there? Uh, can you can you share it from me? Okay, we can we can start from here. Sure. We can start from here. Okay. One minute, sir. We are sharing. No problem. No problem. Because uh, it's only the desktop okay. that will be. I think there's some. Echo. Some echo. Mr. Rahul, Rahul. Jai, Rahul. mute yourself. Ah. That is the echo. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So, at the outside, I must thank uh, Dr. Anil Kumar and uh, the entire team of NOTO for having me here and uh, giving me this talk, which is slightly different from the usual uh, transplant-related topic. And this is about prevention of liver diseases. Next slide, please. So, one thing which we have to understand is Everything that we ingest, inhale, or touch that enters our skin actually passes through the liver. So whatever we are eating, whatever we are breathing, whatever we are touching, a part of it is going to pass through our liver. And that is why we have to be careful with everything that we come in contact with. Everything is going to impact our liver. Next slide, please. Now, to understand how we prevent liver diseases, we need to understand what are the symptoms of liver diseases. And this is where it is very important to know that liver diseases are silent killers. Unless 80% of the liver is damaged, we do not get any symptoms. So the symptoms are rare in the beginning and they occur very late. So when they occur, it is like ascites, encephalopathy, bleeding, or hepatocellular carcinoma. How can we diagnose liver diseases early? So a routine health checkup is one which is very often the first time that a liver disease is picked up incidentally. It could be something as simple as a fatty liver on an ultrasound, a high SGOT, SGPT, a high bilirubin, an elevated gamma GT, and one more thing, a platelet count of less than 2 lakhs would almost always indicate that there is a significant amount of liver disease. In fact, there are more liver-related thrombocytopenia than there are primary hematological disorders which cause thrombocytopenia. Next slide, please. Now, 
we are all aware those of us who have watched movies around 20 30 years ago will be familiar with this scene where respected shri amitabh bachchan ji made it famous that alcohol impacts liver and therefore we all know for the last 40 years that alcohol can cause liver damage but there are other causes as well like viral hepatitis which could be hepatitis a hepatitis b hepatitis c hepatitis d e then you have non alcoholic fatty liver disease you have medications which can cause liver disease autoimmune hepatitis wilson's disease but carrier syndrome and over 100 other causes of liver disorders so all these so many disorders can actually affect the liver next slide please so let's start with hepatitis b something which is prevalent in the country it impacts almost 2% of the population of the country the hepatitis b is transmitted in two ways the first is the mother to child transmission which is usually perinatal or even sometimes during pregnancy why it is important because this transmission is a very successful transmission for the virus if a neonate gets infected then the chances of this person remaining hepatitis b positive in the long run is more than 90% the other is the horizontal transmission which is from one person to another person this is a ineffective mode of transmission as an adult if a person gets infected with hepatitis b virus even in the absence of immunization this person has a 95% chance of clearing the virus spontaneously because of the immunity and less than 5% chance that he will become chronically infected so it is important that we uh, we target perinatal transmission for prevention purposes and horizontal transmission would be a add on mechanism for prevention so the horizontal transmission could be from child to child with the use of contaminated needles health among healthcare workers because of the exposure sexual contacts and through blood transfusions next slide please hepatitis b vaccine is the first vaccine which is declared by who to prevent cancer because it prevents hepatitis b which causes cirrhosis and was one of the leading causes of liver cancer till very recent times and because of the widespread use of the vaccine liver cancer now is no longer because of hepatitis b in fact hepatitis b has become has come down the order in etiological factors for hcc it is nash now in india which is the number one cause we have recently published data from 11 centers across the country where we have identified nash as the first cause of hcc uh, across the country so hepatitis b can be prevented with the vaccine which contains a viral protein which is the surface antigen initially this vaccine was derived from the plasma of people who were chronic hep b infected but now we have only the recombinant protein so it is completely safe and can be given to even pregnant mothers or immunocompromised individuals so this recombinant vaccine is basically a gene for hepatitis b surface antigen is inserted into yeast or mammalian cells these cells are then cultured to produce an excess of protein and this protein is then purified and absorbed on the surface of the adjuvant and then you given as an intramuscular injection next slide please the hepatitis b vaccine is available in the form of uh, dosages of 0.5 ml or 1 ml the 0.5 ml contains 20 micrograms per dose but you have to read there are a couple of brands which are 10 micrograms per dose so the recommended dose is for newborns infant children and adolescents less than 18 years of age 0.5 ml that is 20 micrograms per dose for adults it is 1 ml that is 40 micrograms and for those who are on hemodialysis or immunocompromised it's 2 ml that is 80 micrograms per dose next slide the dosing schedule is the most standard and acceptable one as you can see across all age groups is 0 1 and 6 months 
However, if there is a need for rapid vaccination, you can do 0, 1, 2. But then you have to give a booster at 12 months. And then for adolescents and adults, you also have an ultra-rapid vaccination schedule, which is 0, 7 days, 21 days. And then you give a booster at 12 months. So these are the different regimens that are existent, which we use the most common being 0, 1, and 6 months. Next slide, please. The hepatitis B vaccine in children has to be given on the anterolateral aspect of the thigh. It should not be given in the gluteal muscles because of the lower efficacy and the risk of sciatic nerve injury. In others, in children and in adults, we give this on the deltoid, the efficacy is better if you give it on deltoid or on the thigh as compared to in the gluteal muscles. Next slide, please. How efficacious is this vaccination? With one dose, you achieve a protection of 16 to 40%. With two doses, 80 to 95%. And with three doses, you achieve a vaccination success of 98 to 100%. The only people where we have to be very cautious is preterm infants less than 2 kg. They have a less successful response and therefore we may give booster to this group of children. Next slide, please. In older people, the response rate is slightly lower. Above the age of 40 to 49 years, the response rate is more than 90%. Uh, between the age of 50 to 59, it is more than 80%. And beyond 60 years of age, it falls lower. Those who are above 40 years are obese, have a history of smoking, or any chronic systemic illness, the response rate is lower. But in all those who are less than 40 years of age, the response rate is more than 95%. Next slide, please. 5 to 10% of people do not respond to this three-dose schedule. And those who do not respond to the standard dose do not really benefit with the repeat of the same dose. So what do we do for them? If somebody has not responded by, and has not formed the antibodies which we require, then we offer them either double dose or we give them a four-dose schedule or instead of uh, intramuscular, we give them an intradermal vaccination or we can give them what is called as component vaccines. Next slide. So how do we know whether somebody is responded and is safe? We do anti-HBS titers. More than 10 MIU is protective. It is used to cut as a cutoff to define the response. And once somebody has achieved this titer, more than 90% chance that he will remain protected for the at least next 30 years, even if the anti-HBS antibody later decreases. And that is why there is no need for a booster dose of hepatitis B vaccine if your anti-HBS titer has ever been more than 10. Next, please. Are there any adverse events? The mild adverse events may be there in around 2 to 3 per 100 like mild pain, mild erythema or swelling, some fever. And severe reactions are 1.1 per million. So per 10 lakh dosages, one uh, severe reaction may take place. Next slide. Now, what is new is the birth dose and emphasis on the birth dose to prevent the mother to child transmission. Next slide. This is the WHO guide for how we can introduce and strengthen the hepatitis B bird dose vaccination. Extremely important. I think all of us who are in public health must read this document. It's a very small one-page document. Very important. Next slide, please. Why it is important to give the bird dose? As we discussed, early infection, greater risk of chronic infection. And therefore, we need to prevent this early infection from mother to child. As you can see, the more the age of acquisition of the hepatitis B virus, lesser is the chance of chronicity. Earlier the acquisition of the virus, more is the chance of chronicity. So we have to prevent the transmission early in the course of the life of the child. 
Next slide. After birth dose, do we require more doses? Yes. A single birth dose is not adequate. Usually, you would give a three-dose schedule additionally, which would be include along with the DPT vaccination. When the child comes for that, along with that, you can give the hepatitis B vaccine. And that is what is a very practical dose schedule. So in all, the child receives four, the first one at birth, and then the three doses is along with the DPT vaccine. Next, please. Now, the other thing that we have is immunoglobulin, the hepatitis B immunoglobulin, and we'll be discussing with that shortly. So at birth, if the mother is hepatitis B positive, then what we give along with the vaccine is the immunoglobulin. Because together, they increase the efficacy of prevention of the mother-to-child transmission. The HBIG has challenges like high cost, refrigeration, limited availability, but now, as part of the National Viral Hepatitis Control Program, HBIG is available to everybody. So every pregnancy where the mother is hepatitis B positive, now, as part of the National Viral Hepatitis Control Program, the hepatitis B immunoglobulin is being provided completely free of cost. If the HBIG is also administered along with the vaccine, then the vaccine and the HBIG should be given at different locations. Remember, both are given on day zero. So they should be with different locations and different syringes. Next, please. So even if a child is premature, low birth weight, small for age, HIV infected, or has jaundice, we can still give hepatitis B vaccine. There is absolutely no contraindication. Next slide. In addition to just having a prevention with the vaccine and immunoglobulin, we have to also be aware that there's a very simple treatment algorithm which is now being provided under the National Viral Hepatitis Control Program where the diagnostics and the therapeutics for hepatitis B are given completely free of cost. A very simple algorithm. We would look at whether the person is hepatitis B positive or not. If the person is hepatitis B positive, then you see whether the person has cirrhosis or no cirrhosis, only by doing simple blood tests and sonography. If on simple tests, we find that the patient is cirrhosis, then irrespective of the age, ALT, E antigen, DNA, this patient should undergo treatment. If the person is surface antigen positive, but non-cirrhotic, you look at the SGOT, SGPT. If the SGOTPT is elevated and the viral load is more than 20,000, then you offer this patient treatment. If the person is non-serotic and has normal SGOTPT and the HBV DNA is less than 2,000, then this patient does not require any treatment. For the other two groups, that is high SGOTPT but viral load less than 20,000 or normal SGOTPT and viral load more than 2,000, Treatment is given only if the patient has fibrosis on non-invasive tests. And then once you start the treatment, the treatment is lifelong. So I don't think we can have a simpler treatment algorithm anywhere else in the world. Such a simple algorithm doesn't exist. And that is why we are now able to offer a simple hepatitis B treatment algorithm across the country as part of this National Viral Hepatitis Control Program. Next slide, please. Now we come to hepatitis C transmission. Hepatitis C gets transmitted directly through blood or fluid exposure, and it can be prevented by using safe blood practices. The other is sexual activity and sexual promiscuity. So safe sex is again another modality for prevention of hepatitis C transmission. And third commonest is through IV drug user needle sharing. And here, Harm reduction measures are far better as compared to other practices. So these, this is how hepatitis C transmission happens, and we can prevent the transmission by using these simple measures. Next slide, please. Another way to 
prevent hepatitis C transmission chain is by screening and treating people who are at high risk of spreading this hepatitis C virus in the community. So who should be screened? Patients who have had blood transfusions or repeated blood products in the past. So hemophiliacs who have received blood products or thalassemics who received repeated blood transfusions or somebody who has had a trauma and massive transfusions, IV drug users, antenatal mothers, people who live with HIV donors, and patients who are on hemodialysis. So these are the people who should be screened for hepatitis C. Next slide. Once somebody is screened with hepatitis C, all we do is a HCV RNA and see if the patient has cirrhosis or not. If the patient doesn't have cirrhosis, you give blood declarators well for 12 weeks. If the patient has cirrhosis, then you see whether it is compensated or decompensated. Next slide. If the patient is decompensated, then you give soft velpa reba for 12 weeks or soft velpa for 24 weeks. The doctor is managing, can actually administer this therapy for hepatitis C. So the goal is that by 2030, we should eliminate viral hepatitis as a public health problem. Good strides as a country to, to achieving this goal. And we have already significantly treated a large number of patients with this simple treatment regimen. Next slide. Now we come to post-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Next slide. So for those who have PEP for hepatitis B, remember hepatitis B transmission after needle stitch injury can happen in 6 to 30 percent. And there are several reasons for this variability depending on the viral load of the patient, the type of injury to the patient, the type of needle that we are using. And therefore, it is advisable to consider post-exposure prophylaxis in the right settings. What we have is a vaccine and an immunoglobulin. Next slide. So this is how all healthcare workers should be actually evaluated and their vaccination should be managed, all healthcare professionals. So we should, those of us who have received a vaccine should undergo a tighter evaluation of anti-HBS antibody. If your anti-HBS antibody is more than 10, no need for any booster or any PEP, even if you get exposure. If your titers are less than 10, you take one dose of hepatitis B vaccine. After this one dose, if your titers become more than 10, you are safe for at least next 30 years. No need for taking any prophylaxis uh, in future exposures. If despite this one dose, anti-HBS remains less than 10, then we give two more doses of hepatitis B vaccine and repeat the titers. If the titers are still, are now more than 10, then you are safe. But if the titers are still less than 10, then these are the patients where you would these are the healthcare workers where we would give other strategies like double dose, four dose regimen, or intradermal administration or component vaccines. Next slide. The exposure could be occupational or non-occupational. Occupational could be a needle stick injury, or it could be non-occupational like bite with a, sorry, the occupational like bite with breach of skin, or non-occupational like sexual exposure. So depending on the two. The strategies vary. Next slide. We have to also use HBIG, the hepatitis B immunoglobulin. So following any acute exposure to blood containing the HBS AG, you give hepatitis B immunoglobulin 0 0.06 milliliters per kilogram to be administered within 24 hours. For perinatal exposure, the dose is 0.5 milliliters and preferably within 12 hours. And following sexual exposure, the dose is 0 0.06 milliliters per kg, and it has to be given within 14 days of the contact. Now, this is based on the concentration of 312 or more IU per milliliter, whereas the preparations that we have in India vary between 100 to 300, and therefore, you have to calculate the dose correctly 
based upon the concentration in the preparation that you are buying. And this is very important. Otherwise, you will be underdosing your people. So please read carefully what is the concentration of the immunoglobulin that you are going to give to your, to your healthcare worker. Next slide, please. So for occupational exposure, if the, there's a documented responder after complete series, nothing to be done as discussed. Somebody who has, whose response is unknown, you will test the titers. If it is more than 10, nothing needs to be done. If the person is completely unvaccinated or is not able to, uh, you know, or, or uh, incompletely vaccinated more than two years ago, then these are the people where you will give both full dose of vaccination and one dose of hepatitis B immunoglobulin. If you have a documented non-responder, then you have to be much more aggressive. You have to give this person two doses of hepatitis B immunoglobulin separated by one month gap. Next slide, please. So after hepatitis B and C, let's move to the third group, which I'm talk, going to talk about between these three groups, steatotic liver diseases, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, we find almost 98% of all patients of liver diseases. So what is this steatotic liver disease? It includes both non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as well as alcoholic liver disease. So how can we prevent them? Next slide, please. So what is NASH or NAFLD? It is too much of fat in the liver. By 2025, it is projected that more than 30% of adults across the globe will have fatty liver disease. In India, we have already crossed this figure. We are already at 34%. Amongst children across the globe, it will be 13% of children. We are already at 15% in India. If you move to fat plus significant injury, that is NASH, it was projected that 20, by 2025, 3 to 4% of all adults across the globe, we have already crossed this number, 15 to 20% of obese adults, and 25 to 70% of people having bariatric surgery would reach the stage of NASH when they present to us. Next slide. How can we prevent this? So, five very basic principles. First is weight maintenance. So, maintain your body weight. Regular exercise. Controlling the risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol problems, LDL, triglycerides, dietary modification, having low saturated fats and low amount of simple carbohydrates and avoiding unnecessary medications. So this is easier said than done, but the very fact that one third of our population is suffering means it is not easy to follow these principles, especially in today's era of the easy availability of junk food, and the sedentary lifestyle that we have, it becomes increasingly challenging. Next slide, please. We have to also be aware of the drugs which can cause liver injury. And if you, this list is huge, not that everybody on these drugs will have a liver injury, but if you look at it, some of these drugs are so commonly used. Acetaminophen, that is paracetamol, antimetaboloids, valproic acid, ART drugs, statins, amoxicillin clavulinic acid, diclofenac, flucloxacin, antitubocular drugs, leflunamide, methyl dopa, phenytoin, statins, antifungals like turbinafine. So these are so commonly used. So we have to be aware of these. Antihypertensives are there. So all these drugs can cause liver injury. So do not have these drugs unless there is a good indication and avoid self-medication. Next slide. So if you look at the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it starts off as a healthy liver. When fat gets deposited in this liver, it is called as fatty liver. Once this fat turns rancid, it causes inflammation in the liver that is called as NASH. And then it progresses to fibrosis and cirrhosis. And then it progresses to decompensated cirrhosis or liver cancer. 
Next slide, please. Now, this is this month, the new terminology, the terms non alcoholic fatty liver have been given up. Similarly, the term NASH is also been given up. So, what is the new terminology? The new terminology is steatotic liver diseases. This is further categorized into five types. Anybody with a fatty liver is steatotic liver disease. The first is MASLD, that is metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. The second is MET-ALD. This is a combination of metabolic dysfunction plus incre increased alcohol intake, depending on whether it is more of metabolic dysfunction or more of alcohol intake, which is contributing to the liver disease, you call it MASLD predominant or ALD predominant MET-ALD. Then you have alcohol associated steatotic liver disease. Then you have a fourth group, which is specific etiology steatotic liver disease, which can be drug induced, genetic, especially monogenic and miscellaneous. And finally, where you do not have metabolic dysfunction, person is not taking alcohol, there is no genetic predisposition, and the person still has steatotic liver disease, that becomes cryptogenic steatotic liver disease. Next slide, please. So of this, the most important is the MASLD. How do you really diagnose if there are causes of metabolic dysfunction like dyslipidemia, diabetes, high BMI, hypertension, trig high triglycerides, then there are specific criteria which have been mentioned based on which you can say that the patient has metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. Otherwise, you look for specific causes based on this algorithm and you make a diagnosis of MET-ALD, cryptogenic SLD or a specific etiology SLD. Next slide, please. Finally, we come to the last part of my talk and that is about alcohol. And these are the questions which I get very often. The first question which everybody asks me, whether I'm with my family, with my friends, in parties, or I'm giving a talk. Is there a safe limit to alcohol consumption? How much can I drink without causing damage to the liver? So the answer is there is nothing like a safe limit. Even one drink can actually cause deposition of fat in the liver. Does it mean that everybody who drinks will have a liver disease? The answer is no. Almost 20 to 30 percent of people who have significant alcohol consumption will actually develop a major liver disease. But who will develop and who will not develop cannot be predicted as of today. So in order to save your liver, it is best that you completely abstain from alcohol. If a person already has a fatty liver or a cause for liver disease, then he should remain away from alcohol completely. Somebody who is absolutely healthy, there is no liver issue whatsoever, there is no fatty liver, no metabolic risk factors, then for this person, the safe limit of alcohol would be around 10 to 20 grams of alcohol per day. Eating food with alcohol reduces the risk of alcohol toxicity, but does not eliminate it. In fact, overeating and alcohol consumption gives rise to a combination of MASLD and alcohol that is now called as MET-ALD. Similarly, there are now weekend drinkers, people who drink on weekends only, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Are they still at risk of liver diseases? The answer is yes. Just because somebody is drinking intermittently does not mean that you are safe from liver disorders. You can still develop liver disease. Also, you are at increased risk of pancreatic disorders if you have a weekend drinking pattern. The last question which I get very often, is wine good for health and is beer safe? I only drink beer or I only drink wine. Is it fine? The answer is unfortunately no. So none of the alcohol is actually good for health. It can cause fatty liver. It can cause damage to the liver. So under no excuse should you use alcohol really. So the only indication is something called as benign essential familial tremors, which is extremely rare where alcohol may be beneficial. Or if you are injecting it into the varices for acute variceal bleed, I think that is where we find it useful. Or for sterilization, 
I think alcohol is useful. Let us use it only for those purposes. Next slide, please. Next, next. No, I think next, next. Next, next. Next. So the last slide which I want to show is certain drug, food items which are considered to be liver protective and anti-aging. So we are now looking at telomerase inhi inhibitors, you know, reductase inhibitors and looking at longevity and living eternally with genetic engineering, which is going to be a reality in the next 50 years. Till that time, probably we have to resolve, resort to these anti-aging liver protective food, which include vegetables like red bell pepper, broccoli, spinach, nuts, avocado with watercress, that is jalkumbi or alif, coffee, papaya, blueberries, bananas, citrus fruits, kiwi, apples, and pear. So these are all liver protective food. You should have these in ample quantities in your diet. Next slide, please. So my summary for hepatitis B, let's get vaccinated. Those who are vaccinated, let us do our titers and ensure that we are safe. Hepatitis C is now curable with simple tablets. So let us diagnose it quickly and treat it aggressively. Both the viral hepatitis can be prevented with the use of safe needles, blood transfusions, safe sex, and for hepatitis B, mother to child transmission prevention with immunoglobulins and hepatitis B vaccine. For Neffeld, you have to exercise to keep your body healthy and keep your liver happy. Eat a healthy, balanced diet to avoid fatty liver disease. Avoid alcohol completely. Avoid self-medications or unnecessary medications. And since we are for the NOTO, liver transplant is now required only for a small group of people who reach the end-stage liver disease. And hopefully, one of the ways of reducing organ scarcity is by reducing the number of people who need liver transplant. So I think that is the another approach which I am so happy that NOTO has taken for this time. Last slide, please. Thank you very much. For an excellent talk, I think uh, it was a where so many messages in this in your talk and so many key information. And uh, for everyone to follow and practice, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, you are already working with us in the Roto as joint director, and we know your capabilities and you are uh, you are doing excellent work uh, in the Roto Soto of Mumbai also. And uh, I think the all the audience which have listened to your talk today and uh, the way you have presented, and especially the simple algorithm of treatment. Uh, which have been devised under the National Viral Hepatitis Control Program, uh, very excellent, and uh, which has made the uh, uh, hepatitis B and C uh, treatment look so simple. Uh, like even the primary care physicians, uh, they would be able to follow them uh, very uh, easily. And uh, we will be able to increase the reach of our uh, uh, treatment facilities uh, to the PHC level. So that way, uh, all the time it is not required that we will be required to uh, uh, send these uh, patients. And these are simple tips, and especially your, uh, you have answered so many doubts, which I think most of the medical uh, professionals also would not be aware of regarding the alcohol, uh, which we think that in a small amount it may be of benefit. Uh, so, so thank you so much for that excellent talk. And uh, uh, Rahul, are there any uh, questions in the chat? No. So, if there is any question from the people in the room, then we can. No, Dr. Shaini, you want to ask? Dr. Shaini uh, Pradhan, who is joint director in the NOTO, uh, she would be asking you a question, sir. Sure. She, sure. she is in uh, NOTO. Uh, thank, thank, you, you, yeah. thank you, Dr. Akash. It was very informative. I just wanted to know how frequently should one check for his titer? 
because most of us were vaccinated. So just like you tell me, we should check our uh, titles regularly. So how should we? Thank you, Anand. Thank you so much for that question. I think it is extremely important that we check our titers at least once. And if once our titers are more than ten, we are safe for next thirty years. So we have to recheck the titers only if it is less than ten. If it is less than ten, we give one booster dose and check it again after four weeks of the booster dose. And if now it is more than hundred, oh sorry, more than ten, you are now safe for next thirty years. Uh, one more question, Doctor Krish Kumar, our senior CF, Chief Medical Officer, is that not all? He would be asking, sir. Uh, thank you for wonderful talk, sir. Uh, we enjoyed it, and uh, we are enlightened by it. Thank you. Now I am uh, uh, coming to a very very uh, controversial topic about the alcohol. So, uh, you have said absolutely no to alcohol consumption. Is it feasible? One. Once, once uh, there is a dilemma between the, uh, at the one end, we are coming up with the more, more and more liquor shops because they are the revenue generation, generation things. And somehow we are not able to control it. At the other end, we are recommending that even a drop of alcohol is injurious to the health. So how to balance this dilemma? Because if we say no, 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 at the one end, because we, sh we need to look at the practicality of the things. At the one end, to generate the revenue, we are coming up with more and more liquor shops. At the other end, we are saying, no, it should not be consumed. So uh, just by saying that uh, we should not consume, we should come up with some balance view. What do you say on that? I think, thank you, sir. I think you have raised a very pertinent point. And uh, I agree with you that, you know, it is impossible for everybody to completely remain away from alcohol. Having alcohol is a reality. It has existed for uh, right from the inception of whenever alcohol was discovered. But as a medical profession, I think we have to accept that drinking alcohol is harmful and therefore we cannot endorse alcohol consumption. So administratively or revenue wise, it is important. But I think as a medical fraternity, we have to say what is medically appropriate and that is that consumption of alcohol cannot be considered to be safe and it is considered a potential carcinogen, it is potential hepatotoxic and therefore it is best to stay away from alcohol completely. While I think the way uh, government is talking of revenues, it is an indirect way of actually discouraging alcohol consumption by making or uh, putting taxes on it and therefore making it more expensive and more and more out of reach of individuals. And I think that is an indirect way of ensuring that, you know, the alcohol consumption is lesser. While we cannot eliminate it properly, completely, that, as we know that reality is that even in states where alcohol is prohibited, we know that alcohol consumption can be a problem and is a reality. So we accept that. But I think as a message which we have to give to people and individuals who want to seek this knowledge, I think we have to tell them that having alcohol is not good. So you are muted. I can't hear you. What I am trying to say is just by uh, 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 saying no to thing which is not... Uh, 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 to saying that uh, there is zero alcohol, at least then they will try to minimize it, those who want to. Sir, again, you are muted. You can answer this, then next I'll, one yeah, more. So up to 23 is what is considered for our population. And even in the fatty liver disease, that is what has been uh, given for the Asians, while it is 24, 25 for the Western population. So 25 for Western population and for us it is 23. If the hepatitis B vaccine status is unknown, then how to go about it? Do we need to take all three doses again? Yes, so if the hepatitis B status is unknown, 
it is better to assume that the person is unvaccinated and you restart the vaccine. Okay. So, thank you so much, sir. Uh, for uh, clarifying all those doubts and uh, excellent pre presentation. So, thank you so much. So, I will go to the next speaker. Yeah, Dr. Ashwin. Thank you, Dr. Akash Kukla, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin, sir. Thank you for joining. When we talk about organ donation and transplantation, questions like how to donate organs, is it legal to donate organs? If I donate organs, all will somebody take my organs even while living? Will my organs be in safe hands after donation? What is organ trafficking, etc. Strikers. We have an interesting session on legal aspect of organ donation by Dr. Anand Kumar, sir, who is also director no to. Sir, I request you to kindly. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Rahul, please. <laughs> First slide, plus, plus. Go to first slide. First slide now. Yeah. So, welcome again. Uh, uh, I will be talking about the legal aspects of organ and tissue donation, uh, which is also very important for all the uh, professionals who are working in the field of organ donation and transplantation, as well as the general public, uh, who uh, uh, whoever will require uh, transplantation and all the society members, they should be aware of the law in our country. Uh, regarding the organ donation because many people they want to donate but uh, but we sometimes uh, are on the wrong side of the law when it comes to rock organ donation and transplantation so uh, thank you so much so this uh, is a, this webinar which is being organized is under the Amidan Mahotsa uh, campaign and, uh, and uh, next slide please so, this is the estimated need of the organ transplant in our country and this is annual need. We require annually 2 lakh new patients of the kidney transplants who require, uh, will be added every year. Liver we have 30 to 50,000. Then heart we say 50,000 every year. And these are the need, this is not based on a very scientific study but these are the estimated needs by the experts. Then transplants that we have done in 2022, uh, the numbers that we counted, uh, roughly we did 11,423 kidney transplants, liver 3,718 transplants, and heart 250, lung 138, pancreas 24, three small bowel. To total, 15,561 transplants, out of which 2,765 Transplants were done from deceased donor organs. Next, please. Next. So, what are the various issues and challenges that we have? One has been highlighted in earlier talks also that we have a high burden. Demand side, need for organ transplants is very high. Then there are certain hospital level issues. Less brain stem identification certification. We heard Dr. Sandeep Veshya talking about the how the brain stem death needs to be identified. Then there are gaps in reporting. We are not getting the required data uh, that we because th that is very important for not only planning but also for maintaining transparency and doing the surveillance of the organ donation and transplantation. Then disease donor maintenance and critical care. Dr. Rahul Pandit also contributed in his talk about this. Then infrastructure availability, especially in government sector, most of the transplant facilities are in private sector. Then 
our societal attitude towards the donation. So we, uh, like in blood, we have 80 lakh people coming forward for blood donation, but so we do not uh, 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 think that there is a uh, at, uh, there is a lack of attitude, but there is a lack of awareness. So people want to donate, but they have to be informed of the correct way. Then availability of transplant coordinators. Then there are certain administrative issues like uh, transportation of organs, then organ trading, which concern still continues, high cost, protection of living donors. Next, please. So this is the total, if we compare uh, 2021, and uh, India is third highest in the world in the total number of transplants. This red bar indicates the transplants which are coming from the deceased donor. So in our case, the height of this red bar is very low. Red or brown color that you are seeing is very low as compared to the proportion is very low as compared to the country. So out of the total transplants, our disease donor transplant proportion is quite low. So the, which we have to reverse. Next, please. If we look at comparison of per million population. So the number of disease donors per million population. Per million means per 10 lakh people. How many people are donating? Last year, we had 904 donors all over the country in a population of 1350 million. So that comes to 0 0.67 per million population, less than one. So, but there are countries in the world where the organ donation rate is reaching around 48, 47 like Spain and there are other countries. So we are at around 50th level among all the countries in the terms of number of donors per million population. So that is a serious gap that we observe. Uh, so next please. This is over the years that how we have been uh, perform performing. So like since 2013, we have been increasing our numbers, total number of transplants and but oh, except during the COVID when there was a dip. Uh, so we have been able to multiply our number by three times over the years. Next please. Then coming to the law. Law, we, law is called Transplantation of Human Organs and Tissues Act, 1994. It was promulgated in, on 8th July, 1994. Tissues were added in 2011. So earlier it was Thoa and it was changed to Thota. The purpose of the law is, one is regulation of removal, storage and transplantation for therapeutic purposes. Because we, the law allows for removal of these organ and tissues only for treatment purpose. Second is prevention of commercial dealings. So in the law, rules were changed, uh, issued from time to time. And the latest rules, 2014, they override all the earlier rules. So latest rules are 2014 rules. Next, please. Okay. So, uh, coming to, uh, there are certain definitions, the brainstem death, which we need to understand under the law. Brainstem death means the stage at which all functions of the brainstem have permanently and irreversibly ceased. So, yesterday we also had a lecture on uh, brainstem death. Then deceased person, deceased person means the dead person. The law says the deceased person could be dead because of the cardiopulmonary death or because of the brainstem death. So both are considered brainstem dead. Then the third important definition under the law is payment. The law says that no payment in cash or kind can be made for organ donation. So, but payment can be made well, in, in money or money's worth. But payment can be made for cost of removing, cost of transporting, or cost of preserving the organ. Or for any expenses or loss of earnings incurred by a living donor. So that can also be acceptable payment. So these are the two acceptable payments which are allowed under the law. Next, please. 
So brainstem death already today we had an extensive lecture that uh, this is the area in the brain which includes midbrain, pons and medulla where if the, it is damaged then this is an irreversible situation but the main advantage of this situation is that when this person who is brain dead is in an intensive care setting there is a window of opportunity till declare from the time he is declared brain stem dead to the time his heart stops this gap is there in which his organs can be kept functional with the support system in the ICU and organ donation can happen. So four doctors, they certify the person as brain dead as per the law they, uh, and the brain dead has to be tested. Uh, 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 the tests have to be done twice a day, two times with a minimum gap of six hours in adults and in children the gap increases as Dr. Sandeep Vishya already today informed all of you. Next please. So four doctors, they are all doctors. One is in charge of the institution and one is a treating doctor. And the third category is an independent specialist who is nominated uh, by the in charge of the hospital from the panel which is approved by the appropriate authority. And the fourth doctor is a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, again nominated by the hospital and from the panel approved by the appropriate authority. If neurologist or neurosurgeon is not available, then an anesthetist or an intensivist can replace him in, play, in his place for uh, certifying the brainstem death. So this is a board which is defined under the law. And this certification is essential to permit removal from any brain stem dead donors. Next, please. There were certain amendments done in 2011, many of which were to increase the pool of deceased, basically to facilitate deceased donation. One was provision of transplant coordinators. These are the dedicated professionals and for encouraging organ donation, coordinating the entire process. Then registration of retrieval only centers. Then third was a mandatory request for organ donation from the, potent, from, from the families of potential donors which are available in the ICU. Then as already told that brainstem death is also now permitted by anesthetist or intensivist. Then eye or cornea retrieval is now permitted by a trained technician. Then uh, that there is a uh, uh, central government was given a mandate to establish a national network of uh, basically uh, the all the hospitals and uh, uh, at uh, at a national as well as regional level uh, to uh, for efficient procurement system and distribution of the organs and tissues and also maintain a national registry. So these two mandates were given to the central government in 2011. Then there were certain uh, amendments which were related to the living donor. So one of them is expanding the living near relative criteria with which earlier only the four categories of living donors uh, like relations were there as near relative. That is the parents, children, spouse and siblings. Sibling means brother and sisters. But now, uh, after exp expansion, grandparents and grandchildren are also included. Then, swap donation, that is the donor exchange in case of a biologically incompatible pair of donor and recipient was permitted. And also it mentions clearly that no organ can be removed from a mentally challenged person. Then, punishments were also increased hugely back in the 2011. Next please. So, tissues and tissue banks were included. 2011, next please. Uh, then, law also provides for state level, uh, a appropriate authority in every state. Appropriate authority is the main authority which has all the powers of the law. Basically, every state can have one or more officer to be appointed by the state government as an appropriate authority. So it is an officer, it is not a board, it is not a committee, it is an officer. So it is basically first is, is what are the functions of the appropriate authority is grant of the license. License for what? 
either transplant or retrieval or tissue bank. So all three of them, they require license, which is valid for five years and then further renewal is also to be granted by the appropriate authority. They are authorized to conduct inspection. They are required to approve the brain stem death experts. They are also authorized to investigate complaints of any of the breach of any of the acts or rules and they have power of civil court. They have right to summon, suspend and cancel registration. So they can issue notice. So they have all the powers of the civil court. They cannot order arrest, but they can issue notices. Next, please. Then, as per the amendment, after the amendment, what kind of donors we have? We have living donor and deceased donor. So living donor has to be more than 18 years. And what the living donor has to donate, it has to donate as per the prevalent medical practice. That is either one kidney or a portion of the liver. That is, it could be living person, it could be near related as already told you. The second is the other than near related. When it is not one of the near relative uh, relation is there, then it is other than near relative, which could be a distant relative, could be a friend, could be anybody. Then swap also I told you. So these are the various kinds of living donor. Then we have deceased donor. Deceased donor has no age bar. It could be any age person can be a deceased donor. So even from a zero day to 100 years or whatever age the person dies can be a disease donor. Then disease donor could be a donor after natural death, like person dying at home or dying in a ward or so after natural death. Then only tissue donation is possible within six hours of the death. After brainstem death, both organs and tissues can be donated. And now we are talking about cardiac death also in which usually in our country till now we have been able to donate kidney and tissues. Next please. So which organs and tissues can be donated? We should be aware of this. This is very important that after as a brain death, after death, which organs? So these are mainly kidney, liver, heart, pancreas, lungs, mm -hmm. intestine. So six major organs which are life-saving organs. So we have two kidneys, we have two lungs, so total makes it eight. So one can, uh, and sometimes one can divide the liver also. And what are the common tissues which are donated? Cornea, skin, bone and heart valves. So next please. So it will just show the picture of kidney, liver. Click, click, click. Yeah. click, click. Yeah. So liver, kidney, skin, bone and cornea. Dr. Radhika Tandon in the next session will be taking cornea donation. Next please. So recently Honorable PM has already uh, given this message that one organ donor can save eight lives. Uh, during his monkey bath in the 99th episode, he uh, reiterated those words. Next please. So this is the donor exchange where when it is a biologically incompatible pair of donor and recipient. So they can, uh, donor, if one donor uh, is matching compatible with the recipient too, then they can exchange. So this is pair donation. Next, please. Then we have another body under the committee uh, law, which is authorization committee. Authorization committee, it is a committee, it is a seven member committee under the, in charge is the hospital MS or the medical director where the transplant is going to take place. And it can be, but that hospital should be having, doing a volume of transplant of more than 25 transplants in a year. Otherwise, it could be, it, has, it should be a state level committee also. Usually we say every state should have at least one state level authorization committee. We, besides that, they can have lower level, that is hospital or district level committees. And this is to, up, what are the roles of this committee? They have to approve the living organ donor. Which are other living organ donor, they will, those cases which will go to them, other than near relative. So other than near relative can also donate uh, as per law provided the donation is for the reason of affection and attachment. So 
anyone can donate to anybody. So I want to give this message through this webinar that any person can donate to any person, any other person, provided that donation is for the reason of affection or attachment. Because sometimes we receive complaints that these cases are not taken up by the hospital authorization committee, which is wrong. Any person is allowed to donate to any other person, provided there is an affection and attachment between them. And that is for deciding that there is an authorization committee provided under the law. Then every strap case has to go to authorization committee. Any organ donation in which a foreigner is involved, that is a living case, a foreigner is there, uh, or either as a donor or recipient, those will also, cases will also go to authorization committee. Next, please. Next. So, why uh, this is slide shows that how quickly the organs they need to be transplanted after they are removed. So, like in case of heart, it is four to six hours, which is the lowest, and lungs four to eight hours, intestine six to ten hours. The liver is 12 to 8, uh, 15 hours, pancreas 12 to 24 hours, kidneys is the maximum 24 to 48 hours. So why it is important to know this? Next slide. Because we have to, that's why a organized system of uh, procurement and distribution of organ is required. Like we under the pro, uh, uh, organ transplant program uh, and the mandate which is given under the act, which we told you about the national network. We have established a network till now of uh, one national organization, NOTO, uh, at national level, five regional organization, and till now 20 SOTOs are there. And hospitals are 758, which are linked up with this network. And so that's how uh, patient registration, the, any patient who requires a disease donor organ is registered by that particular treating hospital uh, with the NOTO because every treating hospital, the transplant hospital, uh, which is linked with NOTO, uh, they are given the user ID and password and their staff can register the patient with the NOTO registry. And after registration, a unique ID is given by the NOTO and that unique ID is countrywide valid and any but patient can register, will register only through one hospital, but has the option to change the hospital. So that's why how we will have a waiting list. So this registration will do what? But this will generate a hospital wise waiting list, a state list, and a regional list. So whenever a uh, organ donor is available, so whenever a organ donor is available, uh, like in the donor hospital, so that information, like go to the next slide, previous slide, please. The information has to be given uh, to the respective SOTO, like this donor is available, then SOTO will look into the waiting list first within the hospital where the donation has happened, and then if not being utilized within that hospital, then it will, the organ will be given to the state list. If not being utilized in the state, then it will be given to the regional list. Uh, and obviously, when it is to be, uh, allocation is to be done by the regional level, it will be done by the respective ROTO. Then it will go to the national list. So, this is a hospital, uh, if it is a transplant hospital, at least one kidney is to be shared with the common pool for uh, organ allocation. If other organs they can utilize, they can very well utilize as, but they have to give it as per the waiting list as available with the NOTO. So if it is a retrieval hospital, all the organs will be shared. And I would also like to inform you if the national, if there is no Indian taker in the entire country, the organs can also be allocated to a person of Indian origin or even to a foreigner in that order. So this is the, how the entire organizational framework of organ procurement and distribution works. Thank you. Next, please. Sorry. Next. So we also maintain a national registry, which includes uh, transplant registry, which starts from the waiting list. And then after the uh, transplant is done, then the transplant details and the follow-up details. 
after the post transplant details then organ donor registry both living and deceased donor registry and tissue registry and a pledge registry the people who register their wish to pledge for organ donation uh, after death next so what we all should do we should all register our wish to pledge for organ donation and pledge is uh, uh, done through the legally through the form number 7 Uh, and website is this that is noto.mohfw.gov.in we also have a toll free helpline number which is 18001147700 for any kind of uh, facilitation required in pledging or for coordination or for obtaining any information regarding uh, organ donation this number is functional 24 by 7 and after pledging on the form 7 a donor card is also issued but it is also a, a, a basically i would like to emphasize that after pledging the family uh, should be informed uh, as after once the person dies the consent of the family will be mandatory it is not that once you have pledged that the organ donation can be done it is only if the family agrees after the death of the pledger Uh, then the organ donation is possible we have the option to unpledge also if desired so uh, also currently in the campaign mode organ donation pledge facility is also available on the mygov website if you write organ donation pledge on mygov it will uh, that link will come and you can also uh, download the certificate over there next please so this is just the form number 7 where the which is available both online and offline you want to fill you can send it to the respective soto roto or noto and then organ donor card can be issued next please next uh, transplant coordinator this is the transplant coordinator which is i told you that is the most important uh, member for coordinating the entire Uh, uh, uh organ donation and uh, transplantation process and uh, basically also to counsel and encourage the family members of the deceased person and there are certain qualifications which are defined which could be a doctor could be a nurse or it could be a graduate with preferably a post graduate qualification in social work or psychiatry or sociology or social science or public health next please there are certain duties defined for the doctors in the deceased donor case one i had uh, i had informed you that they are required to request for organ donation they are also required to find out whether the donor had any time authorized for removal and then they are also required to ensure that till the brain stem that is certified and consent is given then no organ can be removed who can give consent next of kin or the closest living near relative or the or any other person who is legally authorized to, uh, as a possessor of the body can give consent for organ donation next please this is the uh, uh, board that we advocate that that should be put up outside the intensive care units where uh, this uh, message should be there that uh, that you can save lives of people by donating organ and tissue this is for the uh, basically the family members encouragement and that the doctor or the transplant coordinator or the counselor on duty they are required by law to, for, to request for organ donation yeah next please in the medical legal cases uh, just one message i want to give that whenever there is a uh, because the though we say that post mortem doctor should be available at the time of retrieval so that both the procedure they can be done simultaneously however if it is not possible then the surgical uh, records uh, the notes of the surgeon they will be part of the post mortem report and the post mortem can happen and the designation designated plate please next please however ministry has issued a circular that post mortem should be done on priority and even conducted during night if adequate infrastructure facilities are available next please these are the various offenses which i think everyone should be aware of 
that uh, uh, because there are very severe penalties if any person gives his service as a doctor to the hospital which is not authorized to do organ removal and uh, then this there, there is a imprisonment up to 10 years and fine up to 20 lakhs if anyone makes or receives payment for supply or offer to supply any human organ again imprisonment ranges from 5 to 10 years and fine ranges from 20 lakh to 1 year so next please anyone publishes or gives an advertisement where it is directly offering the money uh, for organ donation and advertiser is also willing for such arrangement then again the imprisonment is 5 to 10 years and fine is 20 lakh to 1 crore so and anyone who prepares false documents for facilitating this organ trading again fine and imprisonment are similar illegal dealings in even in tissues if somebody is doing the penalties are very uh, in, even in tissues like cornea uh, imprisonment one to three years and fine five to twenty five years so this is how the, the the law provisions are very strict next please one two slides on the recent changes like to because the government is working towards one nation one policy we now have removed condition of the state domicile which some of the states had uh, uh, imposed for registering the uh, patients for deceased donor organ and second is that any person of any age can register for receiving deceased donor organ earlier it was restricted up to less than uh, 65 there should not be any fee for registration of patients uh, uh, for deceased donor organ next please uniform organ transport policy also we are working upon in uh, under the guidance of niti ayog with the seven ministries we have already finalized the standard operating procedure for air trans transfer as well as the metro has also changed its rules to allow for transport of organs this is done by the ministry of uh, uh, basically urban affairs housing and urban affairs where the uh, metro is there next please then uh, recently uh, 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 this is basically a letter we have proposed to the ministry of home for inclusion of uniform definition of death uh, in the registration of birth and death tax, this is under proposal, this is under consideration in the Ministry of Home Affairs. Next, please. Then, withdrawal of life support guidelines have been received from Supreme Court on 24 January, and where a, a where which provides for withdrawal where there is a futility of treatment is established, and definitely a brain stem death situation is also a futility of treatment. So now one can withdraw even if organ donation is not taking place. Next, please. Government, has, central government has sanctioned 42 days of special casual leave to any central government employee who, as a living donor, donates an organ, whether to his family member to or to anyone else. So for up to for, for 42 days, special casual leave have been sanctioned. Next, please. Uh, this is already, I told you, this repeat, next please. Uh, for improvement of brainstem death declaration in the hospital, we are carrying out brainstem death audits in the central government hospitals, but we are now uh, planning to expand it to the entire country. Next please. Uh, the, we, I have also, uh, mon we would like to monitor these three indicators that out of the total deaths, how many brainstem deaths were diagnosed, out of the total brainstem donors, how many actual donors were there, uh, out of the total brainstem deaths, and whether today we uh, heard about the disease donor maintenance. So, disease donors, whether they have been correctly monitored and maintained. So, these are the certain... Uh, quality indicators that uh, which many of the good countries are uh, uh, cutoffs which are the should uh, which is given in the brackets but at least we would also like to reach those parameters yes 
So way forward for us is one nation, one allocation policy we are uh, working on. We are working on one portal only for the entire country and a national registry which is fully uh, updated with uh, all the data reported to this national registry and a digitized allocation. So this is the way forward already uh, we have laid down for the NOTO. Next please. So uh, the key, certain key messages that we would like to give in the end after learning about the law that death is an inevitable truth. Mrityu avasham bhavi hai, par kya mrityu ke baad jeevan ho sakta hai? Can there be life after death? We say yes. Next. So why burn or bury when we have option to donate and save lives? So we should not be wasting organs. We should donate them and save lives. Next, please. So donate organs, save lives. Next. So this is another message. Ek khamoshi, anek muskan, aao kare angdan. Next, please. So angdan mahatsav, uh, organ donation month and the forthcoming organ donation day. So uh, uh, this number we have already, uh, now, now Noto is available on all the so, uh, key uh, social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and uh, 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 and YouTube and Facebook. So we let us be get social everyone. Uh, so today's webinar is also a uh, uh, is also for promoting the basically the digital social media, uh, which we think has a very huge reach. Uh, uh, even next please. So I think it is the last slide. So thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, if there are any questions, I can answer. Uh, sir, on the behalf of uh, the audience, I am uh, asking some questions. I think that will help them. So, first is, sir, uh, after the death, can I choose that whom to donate my organs? Uh, as per the current uh, system, uh, we don't have any such option that we can choose our donor because it is a donation and the donation has to go through a system of waiting list. Uh, and as I depicted in my talk that uh, we first have to look for the waiting list within the donor hospital, then within the state and regional list. So, but in one or two case, court cases where there was a immediate family member who was in need of the organ, that has been allowed, and uh, but till now there is no such policy. So, uh, yeah. uh, sir, uh, another related question is: Can I know to whom the organs of my relative who have donated, I have consented to donate, be uh, uh, known to me? Yeah, such information sometimes get leaked through media, but it is not certainly advisable. Because there have been uh, uh, certain problems reported, particularly in South. I think there was one family uh, who came to know then they, this donor, uh, this recipient went to this donor family and the donor family wanted that they sh this recipient should stay with them because he was having the heart of their son. Uh, he had got heart of his son, so they wanted him to stay with them and uh, be with them, So, which was not practically possible. So there are certain practical and legal issues and uh, in our rule also it is mentioned that we should not uh, 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 we should not uh, the data which is there in the national digital should not be in public domain yeah sir, uh, sir uh, what is the position of a legally adopted child with service and near relative uh, well a legally adopted child is considered as a uh, uh, son and uh, definitely adopted child is a son and uh, if it was uh, legally adopted, so he has all the rights of a son. So he, it will be considered as a near relative, yes. Uh, sir, uh, if it, uh, what, uh, what are you telling about the organ donation? It can be done only in the bigger cities with having the uh, uh, highly advanced centers. Is there any possibility of donation in case that happens at home or in any small clinic? 
actually if the, the organs cannot be donated in a, a at, in the death at home but certainly tissues like cornea and uh, skin they can be donated within 6 hours if the information so as i told you about the my our call center 24 by 7 and dr radhika tandon would also be talking about the cornea donation in a talk next talk and uh, so uh, organs definitely it is not possible to donate uh, sir one last question uh, this uh, once a patient is declared brain dead or as per the new act that futility of treatment is uh, uh, already uh, declared by the two committees which are appointed can a doctor stop the treatment based on that uh, basically, it, because this uh, Supreme Court guidelines, they uh, talk about two uh, boards. One is a primary medical board, and which is which has the experts from the hospital, and a secondary medical board. So, with the consent of the family, if the doctor, treating doctor, sends the information that they, they, this is futility of the treatment case, then with the consent of the family, they go for examination by these boards first by the primary, then by the secondary. So there is a detailed procedure laid down in the Supreme Court guidelines. So that will require a few lecture. So uh, so that is the sir, procedure is there. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. There are, I think, some chat questions which we can take. One is uh, uh, how you motivate the relatives. Actually, uh, as I said, that in our country, 80 lakh people they voluntarily donate voluntarily donate blood every year. So people are motivated in a way, like if they can donate blood, they can very well donate something after death. So uh, we have to just give the information in a correct way and so that people can for come forward. And similarly, cornea donation number is also very high uh, as compared to the organ donation. So why, why we are just uh, near, uh, not even reaching 1000 donors in a year? organ donor so that is we have to give correct information to the society so we hope that today's webinar will go a, a long way maximum age for donor another was question uh, so how you motivate the relatives so we have these transplant coordinators which are qualified and they are trained to motivate and encourage and we also conduct uh, awareness programs through national at national regional and uh, state levels the maximum age for donor, no, there is no maximum age. Anyone can donate uh, if his organs are functional uh, because the doctor who is uh, uh, coordinating this donation, they will examine the donor that whether his organs are functional and can be of use. So there is no maximum age for donation. If recipient is psychiatric patient and donor are good mental health, in this case, transplant will happen. Yes, it can happen. Uh, only if the donor is mentally challenged, that is whether mentally retarded or is uh, having uh, a mental illness, mental retarded or mental illness, then his organs cannot be removed because he is not in a position to uh, give consent. Uh, we are publishing a book on organ donation on 6th August 2023 in Kalyan, Maharashtra, awaiting blessing messages. Okay, maximum age to consider for brain dead persons to donate organs. Again, I told you that there is no maximum age. Uh, drowning, what is, I think yeah. it is or called. Drowning cases, which are then donated. Drowning cases. So again, uh, it is will, but drowning will happen in a, in a, outside the hospital. So there only the tissue donation is possible if the tissues are not damaged. Yes. Uh, no, sir, in case other uh, hypoxia ho gaya patient ho, arrest nahi hua hai, and if patient reaches uh, the hospital, hospital and then it depends, mostly lungs are not uh, available for donation in these cases, but if other organs are uh, working okay, so th they can be considered for donation. So uh, basically, if the whole crux is that once the patient reaches the hospital in the ICU, and he is at uh, that time he is uh, alive or he is he is showing he is not dead that time and uh, he can be then and he can be maintained in the ICU setting then his organ donation is definitely possible. So so there is a question regarding snake bite. Yes, sir. So donation in case of snake bite. Donation in case of a snake bite. 
again uh, it will depend upon the damage and organ damage which has been caused because of the snake bite because there are four types of snakes which cause so uh, so uh, so it will depend upon the and organ damage which is caused so i think we can now uh, go to the next session ashna you can introduce the speaker please thank you so much sir i'm sure that your information informative talk will help and help uh, the institutions as well to work on organ donation with without any risk or without any tension as they are legally completely protected everything is there in our act uh, moving to our next session uh, do you know cornea donation constitutes large section of the cases we register every day of organ and tissue donation why because you can donate cornea even in case of natural death to know more interesting facts and learn about cornea donation and transplantation i would request dr radhika tandon professor of ophthalmology aims to address the next session where is it from hello afternoon i hope am i audible am i audible well loud and clear and uh, is my screen visible yes yes please okay thank you so much and uh, many congratulations to notro for having uh, organized such a wonderful uh, webinar on such a valuable topic which i'm sure is going to make a huge difference to um, the process throughout the country i'm going to cover uh, eye donation and corneal transplantation changing scenarios what i mean by changing scenarios is over time um, how we have evolved based on the analysis of our situation the data that is generated and from time to time how certain measures have been taken uh, and with support with the government of india uh, every help has been uh, um, extended uh, to make the process simple Uh, and uh, of course there are still uh, several things which need to be done and uh, i will mention the key things um, uh, where where relevant so that we can further improve um, Hundred and six. The first successful penetrating keratoplasty was done in Europe, and corneal transplantation started as a clinical process uh, all over the uh, world, and it is known to have a very high rate of success because of the nature of the tissue, which is avascular. And I just want to mention that the concept of an eye bank. So earlier, when it started in Europe, it was a direct transplantation directly from the donor to the um, recipient. And in fact, the first transplant was from uh, a live person who was having the eye removed for a particular disease, and then it was transplanted uh, in a in in a sort of an emergency situation. Uh, then, of course, they processed to the process to, to the procedure of taking it from a diseased person and directly transplanting. until eventually as late as 1944 the concept of an eye bank uh, was the slide is not going i think it's on the first slide only okay uh, i'll just see why one second yeah is it moving now no no ma'am ma'am if you are facing the problem then we can share from our side it is better please yeah. please stop please share stop your share is still ma'am i stop sharing and up share that yeah so to avoid uh, delay i will mention that the concept of an eye bank then started in usa in 1944 and interestingly in india the first eye bank was started in 1948 so it was just 4 years later so india actually has been much in the forefront uh, in this field all over the world just see if you can find the slides and share Yes go to the next please 
Yes, so as I said, the first Thai bank in 1944 in USA and then in Chennai, RIO Chennai, which is now RIO, that time it was um, not an RIO, it was started in 1948. So definitely there is a demand for corneal transplantation which exceeds the available supply and through my lecture, I will try to show you some examples of key steps that have been taken. Uh, go, please, next slide. Next, please. So certain legal barriers have been overcome in India, uh, which Dr. Anil very nicely showed. Now coming a little background, there is a difference between India and other countries in the pattern of corneal disease. Corneal scarring and adherent leukoma, active infectious keratitis and corneal perforation following trauma. So as a lecture on hepatitis B nicely showed that how you can limit the unhealthy demand for liver transplantation by controlling diseases, here again, it is very important that we improve the healthcare services and healthcare service delivery in our country so that these conditions are removed from our waiting list. Uh, it is very sad that very young people are still damaging, having their eyes damaged between um, for, for these reasons, which are totally preventable, particularly chemical injuries and trauma, including children. And also, we still see vitamin A deficiency in North India. So I want to stress that uh, when we're talking about the concept of curing corneal blindness, we must not look at a small aspect of only chasing the goal of corneal transplantation. It is very important that a collective measure is taken to improve health care and knowledge in the community for preventative care. Next, please. So I'm just giving you a spotlight now of one random year, the National Progress Perspective in 2000. So you will see that the, the pattern of the distrib distribution of the corneas donated were extremely high in Tamil Nadu, Gujarat and Maharashtra and Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka. So largely it was South India. Next, please. And over the years, the pattern has been changing. Next, please. So gradually now, say eight to 10 years later, the, co the contribution from Andhra Pradesh has increased. But still, if you see the uh, North India has been a little bit behind. So he, that is why knowing this data, we have to focus on what are the hindrances um, in this part of the country and try to work on those weaknesses. Next, please. So national campaigns then have been stepped up and looking at the data, how looking at the data of 2000 and then efforts were made to increase their knowledge and the uh, contributions in North India. So slowly, slowly, on, uh, all over the country, as well as in North India, the, the, the numbers are building up. But you will see that there is a great mismatch between the collection and the utilization. So here again, we need to improve the, the uh, our utilization. We need to improve the resources for sharing of tissues. There are some states where they do not allow the tissue to cross the border. So certain, such kind of rules where one particular state has taken a decision on their own that tissues will not cross that border. In fact, there are two states in India. So such things should be discouraged and the central government and NOTO should monitor such things because uh, the eye donation, cornea donation is a national resource and there is no point in restricting it to one area when there is a shortage in the other area and it immediately such restrictive practices should be discontinued. Next, please. So looking at a comparative chart again, 2000 and 2008, you can see that generally there has been an improvement all over the, uh, the country. And when we look at the data, as Dr. Anil had also seen, the data is what helps you to focus. And the health secretaries and the healthcare resource development programs in the countries, in the states which are lagging behind, they need to be encouraged that you need to monitor and you need to look into the uh, into the uh, matter and uh, uh, you know identify the weaknesses and ensure that the gap is shortened or, or stopped. It is also possible that they have worse um, eye care delivery. It's possible that the demand is also high, but certainly the supply, uh, there is no reason why the eye donation should not be less, why it should be less than other places. Next, please. So uh, I'd like to give you a spotlight of uh, from the National Eye Bank as another example. So when we 
looked at this kind of concept where we looked at the data in 1998 and then we also looked similarly in 2008. So when you look at data, then you have an actual value, you have a number and you have data with which you can go to the administrators and the authorities to ask for what is needed. And you have to analyze what are the exact reasons why we are falling short. So this is just a number. It's not a matter whether it's 500, 600 or 700. I'm just trying to ex ex explain a philosophy and and um, uh, one thing I would though, though like to highlight, we consider Konya as extremely precious. And you can see that we do not keep any gap between the collection and utilization. So this is something that all I banks should be asked that, you know, you must be very careful. And it is equally your responsibility to make sure that the tissue collected is properly utilized. If you don't have anybody locally, then you must share it with other places where there is a shortage and where they require the tissue. And here I will show you how we had 735 and the extra eyes were used because we actually, we actually had to split. We split the cornea and by new te the therapeutic practices, we were able to give use one cornea for more than one recipient. Uh, next, please. And here we're talking about utilizable corneas. We're not talking about tissues which are serology positive or the corneas are not suitable for transplantation. Now, here again, I'll explain how there are various ways that the cornea can be utilized. So if, for example, at a particular point, the tissue is not suitable for immediate transplantation for optical purpose, the cornea can be saved in glycerine. And in glycerine, it can be preserved for up to a year or two years. And this glycerine preserved tissue can be used in uh, emergency situations and can also be used by glaucoma surgeons if they are requiring a tube transplant. And uh, this will be an example how during COVID pandemic, when the corneal transplantation and I mean, the corneal eye banking uh, activity was completely suspended for eight to nine months in the beginning of the pandemic, it was a glycerine preserved corneas which came in handy for therapeutic keratoplasties. There were many children who came with ulcers where they required the transplantation for, sa for globe salvage procedures and it was the glycerine preserved corneas which were used. Now, um, Dr. Anil did say that that legally we are permitted to take the tissues only for therapeutic purpose and the intention to take the tissue is for therapeutic purpose. However, it is a deceased donor and often after the cornea comes to the eye bank, the tissue itself may not be suitable for immediate transplantation for a recipient. So then those tissues are used for medical education and training and that is permitted uh, by the law the, that cornea can be used if not medically suitable for transplantation it can be used for medical education and training and research comes in that purview and I'll explain later on how such work has also helped to uh, improve uh, limbal stem cell transplantation and also um, endothelial uh, keratoplasty by culture work. So this is one thing when the rules are next um, revised, there should be an understanding that uh, it is good to include the possibility of research as uh, under medical education and training. Next, please. There is no harm in including that as a utilization. So here I'll again like to explain that how corneal surgery has evolved. So now we have this procedure called uh, DALC, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So tissues earlier, which were considered unsuitable for optical keratoplasty, they can now be used for DALC. So that I, I want, would like to explain that. So therefore, so places where the utilization was low, those uh, eye banks should be encouraged to share it with surgeons who are doing the DALC procedures uh, and uh, similarly patch graft, stem cell culture and so on. So uh, over the time, the, 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 the kind of surgery and the technology has improved. So therefore, the utilization also correspondingly improves. Next, please. So um, another example I like to give about how data has improved. So here again, I'm giving you example of how in 1998, at that particular time, emergency was our categorization of children less than six years of age who required uh, keratoplasty, and they had to wait about six months. And similarly, top priority are people who are bilaterally blind, and there were 270 patients who had to wait about 12 months. By reorienting the priority and making making sure that the optical grade tissue was assigned on a priority basis to this um, level of patients, we were able to ensure that the waiting list for these very highly uh, requiring uh, group of patients 
is reduced to nil. And of course, correspondingly, we have to continue increasing the supply so that no patient should wait for, for a long time for a corneal transplantation. And here again, I would uh, encourage that it is also important to have a better eye care services so that the unhealthy demand of so many patients requiring corneas for corneal scarring, healed infections and trauma should also be reduced so that we can uh, bridge the gap. Next, please. So here I'm giving you another uh, out-of-the-box thinking study of death to preservation time and its impact on utilization of donor corneas. Dr. Anil mentioned that deceased donor, the tissue should be harvested in less than six hours. So I'll explain a little bit what I'm going to present here. Next, please. So the idea being that six hours, now if it is six hours, 15 minutes, if it's six hours, half an hour, does it mean that the cornea cannot be taken? And sometimes a family is very keen to donate and the cornea actually can remain healthy for even longer, particularly if it is refrigerated and if the ambient temperature is cold, as happens in North India. In many countries which are of temperate climate or if the bodies are refrigerated, this death retrieval time is even 24 and often even 48 hours. So therefore, why do we have this six hours distinction? And we want to explain that it is not mandatory to have this six hours distinction. And we have proven it scientifically, looking at the donor age, the cause of death, looking at the time between death to preservation. By preservation, we mean the time that the cornea has been put into the corneal storage medium and looked at the duration of preservation on the morphological quality of corneas. Um, next, please. So therefore, we scientifically using the standard method evaluated the corneas, what is the quality of the cornea by quality. I mean each layer of the cornea, how healthy it is for transplantation and then suitably use the cornea for the appropriate need. As you can see in this picture here, the cornea can be split into layers. If a patient's only posterior layer is damaged, then we put that in one patient. And if the anterior layer is uh, damaged in another patient, then the anterior lamellar keratoplasty can be done uh, for, an, uh, for another recipient. Or if you have a donor where the, uh, the donor is aged, the endothelium is not functioning well but the anterior cornea is clear then that cornea can even be given to a younger recipient who has a corresponding disease in the cornea next please So we looked at the primary outcome, the grading of the donor corneas, endothelial cell density, and then looked at the secondary outcome measures after the uh, transplantation, what was the, whether there was any primary graft failure, whether the graft which transplanted were never uh, cleared or was uh, not good right from the beginning. And the other concern, if we prolong the death recovery time, is of course the risk of graft infection, which is why refrigeration is important. Next, please. So if the donor is refrigerated, such as in a post-mortem case, it is kept in the mortuary under a refrigeration. And if the mortuary has good conditions with a proper generator backup for the refrigerator and it's maintaining the temperature properly from 2 to 6 uh, degrees centigrade, then those donors, we can extend the death recovery time. And as we saw, we had looked at 575 donors during this period. Some had medical contraindications, such as uh, they happened to have disseminated malignancy, which was detected, or if they had um, serology positive. And out of this, about 22 were graded as not suitable for surgery. And then we looked at the 431 actual transplants. Next, please. And overall, we were able to show that donor refrigeration had a definite beneficial effect, maintaining the grading, provided that it was within six hours of the death preservation time. And as a corollary, we also extend the, the recovery time in our practical uh, applications in North India during the extreme winter where the ambient temperature is very low. Prolonged death preservation time does has a significant effect on donor culture and prolonged death preservation time is not related to primary graft failure. But the second point is important. So what happens is if we have a death preservation time, which is more than 12 hours uh, in um, uh, winter time or more than six hours in summertime, we are retrieving the corneas, but then sending the uh, uh, 
a specimen for microbiology. And when we get a negative culture report, then we are releasing it for transplantation. And prolonged death utilization time is not related to primary graft failure. Death utilization time, fortunately, we have been able to extend in cornea, um, in the cornea practice because we have corneal preservation medium, which keeps it healthy for four days, which is the MK medium. And now we have a, 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 a chondroitin sulfate-based medium called RPC Sol prepared from RP Center and from Arvind Madurai, it is called Cornisol from Oro Labs and which maintains the cornea healthy for two weeks. And the rate of primary graft failure was not related, but yes, there was a chance of graft infection, which was more com common in the therapeutic grade corneas, that is those corneas which were considered not suitable for optical keratoplasty, but were used for emergency purposes. Next, please. So now I'll give you a little brief on recent trends in eye banking keratoplasty, continuing my theme of how over time with the data and the practice, we have prolonged our, our uh, we have expanded our scope. Next, please. So endothelial keratoplasty, as I said, where the endothelium is transplanted, DLEC, DSEC, and DMEC. These are different ways by which the endothelial layer can be transplanted. Next, please. This gives, uh, when we do a corneal transplant, we want the cornea to survive longer. Because if the cornea doesn't survive, then the patient comes back for a repeat transplant. So that repeat transplant or repeat keratoplasty is again increasing our donor demand. So the better results we get, the less resurgeries we do, the less rejections and better outcomes outcome, the better is the outcome of the service provided. Now, when we start these high uh, tech uh, um, examples of surgery, then of course, we require corresponding donor tissue, the eye bank, the surgeon and the patient. And we're looking at different um, means across corneal keratoplasty centers all over India, as well as eye banks, how we can improve these, uh, these measures. And of course, this also means that there's an implied cost. And this is also to be taken into consideration. Next, please. So pre-cut tissues for surgeons in India, uh, because uh, as Dr. Anil explained, there is no payment or no exchange of money. Next, please. Payment or exchange of money for the donation, but the process of preserving the cornea or making the tissue available for the recipient, there is a cost involved. And at present, entire process of corneal donation and transplantation has been on charitable means that the whole concept is that everything should be free. So in government hospitals, yes, um, a lot of support is given from the government, but in the private place also, it is difficult for them to support totally on charitable measures. So giving an example of pre-cut tissues, because it is not possible for all surgeons in India to have the skill and the means to, to separate the end endothelial layer. So as a, 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 a sort of concept, whether in India we can provide these amenities as it provided in advanced countries like Europe and USA, it was seen whether pre-cut tissues have, can be provided. So an RP center was started in 2008 as a model, it, but it was surgeon driven in the OT. Uh, whereas in another model, uh, an example is uh, LVPI, RIEB Hyderabad, they're looking at it as technician driven in the eye bank. And then there was a corneal distribution system model, which was also experimented with by EBAI and SightLife, looking at the amount of requests per month. And this is the example of what was the need for the private eye banks to provide the tissue, uh, which then the patient would provide uh, from the corneal transplant center. But in the government sector, of course, there is no charge. And we would like NOTO to really step in here. And uh, it should be a national distribution system using the government facilities rather than dep depending on private entities for this. Next, please. So options, of course, manual and automated. So a manual is inexpensive. So the surgeon has to be trained and automated is expensive. Next, please. So, of course, surgeons need to be trained. So, just an example of microkeratome dissection. There is a device, the cornea is fitted into it, and then it is prepared, and it is a well-explained uh, procedure, and it is well-documented and published. This is the kind of technique that we are following uh, in centers which have the facilities. Next, please. Uh, so, the fixation is done on an artificial anterior chamber. Next, please. Then this uh, next piece. And then the tissue is Cut. Next, please. With a slow pass. Next. So this is the initial and then the tissue is available. Next, please. The anterior lamella can be given for one recipient. Next, please. 
and then the posterior lamella can be given for the other. Next page. This is a sample of a publication from Midwest Eye Banks, and I wanted to explain that this is a model that we took. That if America can do it, why can India not? And we should not be far behind. And I'm happy to share. Next, please. That with very several corneal transplant surgeons and eye banks coming to the fore, we are able to provide this service in India. And now coming to the more high higher technology that is DMEC, which is only the Desmet's layer is separated. So here you can see how only the Desmet's layer is separated and you can understand that how much technical skill is involved. And again, we, have, we need to have a cadre of trained technologists and there has to be a provision in the government to create this cadre and provide their salary. Otherwise, it is only going to be taken over in the private sector and the government sector is going to be left behind. Next, please. So this is how preparing of donor tissue for DMEC is done in our center. I had a video, but in lack of time, I will not show. This is being done at RP Center. As I showed that the tissue is put, and I like to show how it was nicely seen, how only the cornea and the rim is removed instead of removing the whole eyeball. And then a plastic cap is put to restore the eyeball in the donor. And there is absolutely no disfigurement of the face. Next, please. And then pre-cut tissues and the tissue then goes to the surgeon. The surgeon takes it out of the vial, puts it on the Teflon block and then just has to punch it and transplant it. This is a more efficient use of OT time, OT table and resources. Next, please. And this is the example of the surgery. You can see how it is a hazy cornea. Then you just have to open up the anterior chamber and insert the tissue and put it in place. So there are no sutures. The rehabilitation is much faster. There is less graft rejection and there are less suture related complications such as suture related infections and rejections. Next please. So assessment of eye band prepared posterior lamella. So here again, I'm giving you an example of the initial peer reviewed publications based on which we have followed. Next, please. And it has been confirmed that eye banks can prepare. It is a more efficient system, but then we need to have the resources. We need to have some measure that the tissue can be transplanted and can be transported, preferably free of charge by the airlines. But otherwise, of course, there should be a nominal fee and it has adequate viability for up to 48 hours. Eye bank prepared tissue. Next, please. Reproducibility of graft preparations. Next, please. Again, that's reproducible. It is reliable and time-tested method with proper technique as high as 98%. Next, please. You can keep doing next faster because there is animation. Yeah, so pre-cut donor tissue, we have again looked at the various. So here I'm encouraging people to look at their data, provide the data and analyze it because scientific publications can be shared with other places and they can also follow the models. Next, please. So following a very scientific method, we have a, a, adapted and used these technologies in our country. Looking at the service uh, surgeons, they were also satisfied. There were no increased risk of complications. Next, please. Next, please. Banking of tissues, again, pre-cut tissue in organ culture medium. Now, organ culture medium is followed, followed in Europe and Australia. Uh, cold storage is USA and India. Next, please. But whatever it is, there's no significant loss of endothelial cells. You can keep doing next because the animation will come faster. So pre-cut tissue has similar improvements in vision and no significant loss. And it can be used again two days if it is in the cold storage. Otherwise, up to two weeks if it is in organ culture medium. Next, please. Now. Uh, looking at the previous data, we found that there was a shortage of tissues in North India. Next, please. So what did we do about it? Next, please. We again analyzed what is the weaknesses. We looked at the collection in India versus Delhi. Next, please. So, that there is, so but what was the sol problem solving? Ad we adopted the hospital cornea retrieval program, which has already been successfully used in many centers in South India. Rather than waiting for the donor family to call the um, eye bank, we felt that we should approach the donor families where there has been a death in the hospital. Next, please. So for this, we required eye donation counselors. Next, please. There is no card of eye donation counselor again. There was no card at that time. So we then looked at the data that we can have a consolidated Delhi a centralized hospital cornea retrieval program combining several corneal transplant centers and eye banks in Delhi supported by um, uh, uh, Sight Life initially. 
funding was taken and HMSC clearance was approved, taking the major large hospitals, which were ideal for HCRP. Next, please. And we were able to generate data to show that having trained counselors with dedicated um, uh, work for this purpose and also proper supervision and also monitoring of their outcome and the death time, the, their posting schedule and encouraging them to discuss what were the problems they had. Next, please. We were able to have a consorted effort to show that there was an increase in the numbers. So based on this now, the National Programme for Control of Blindness has recognized this cadre of eye donation counsellors and eye donation counsellors are being posted in major hospitals in on a contract basis uh, to support hospital corner retrieval programme. Next, please. But still, uh, further improvement can be done in this. Uh, we have improved, uh, but there are a lot of uh, hindrances in the system. And then later, with Noto's help, we can try uh, to see how we can make this again more efficient. Uh, but I just want to give an example of how taking collective measures, one can improve the performance. Next, please. So there's been a growth in the total transplants. And here again, we must concentrate on optical tissue growth. There is no point in taking tissues and not utilizing. So one must, may must also focus that there is every need to make sure that look at the reasons why the tissues are getting damaged, why the tissues are not transplantable. So this is again something that we must be very alert about and uh, try very hard that all the tissues are properly transplanted and utilized. Next, please. Of course, uh, certain cases it's impossible if there has been, say, it turns out to be serology positive, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying every transplantable tissue must be uh, must be must find a place in a recipient. So, giving a few examples of success stories. Next, please. So at the RP Center, we have our director and we have changed our uh, our format. Earlier, there used to be only one officer in charge. Now there is a, the chairman, co-chairman and an officer in charge. This has made a difference because there's a whole team, people who can do brainstorming, there's staff, infrastructure and uh, funding. Next, please. Please carry on. So based on the data we generated and because we did not want to be de dependable on external agencies for funding for eye donation counselors, we were very grateful that the director accepted our request and was able to give us patient care coordinators. As I said, eye donation counselors and grief counselors are terms which are not there in the government cadre. And in fact, uh, as a different aspect, I think patient care coordinator is a much better terminology because that person is actually taking care of the donor family as well as a recipient um, you know, concept. So patient care coordinator is what we call them in AIMS now. Next, please. And as we see, we have had a very very high rate of utilization, more than 70%. Next, please. Then during COVID pandemic, what did we do? We made sure we utilized all our glycerin preserved corneas. The patient, these are our statistics of our patient care coordinator statistics. Even at the time when there was a, a drop, we made sure that there is a good utilization and there is a very little gap, only seven a six gap, a gap of six corneas between 80 and 74. So this is what I would encourage. Every eye bank should be encouraged to do. Be very serious about utilization as well. Next, please. And we keep monitoring. We keep discussing with the patient care coordinator. We have a scientist now who posted who is monitoring the data and repeatedly reporting to the officer in charge. And sometimes, for example, uh, the, the, uh, if there are any gaps found, immediately a corrective measure is taken to make sure there is no um, uh, for a drop in our performance. Next, please. So this is just an example how um, we keep monitoring every month. Next, please. Next, please. You can keep going. This is just an example. So how extremely important it is that such statistics should be monitored. And I would encourage NOTO to keep monitoring the statistics that it gets from, ev from every tissue bank in the country. Is it getting the statistics on time? And what are they showing? Next, please. The NOTO, ROTO, and SOTO. Now, coming to multi-organ donors, we suddenly noted some unexpected challenges. We suddenly found that there were a few multi-organ donors where every organ was donated, but there were a few of them where the families refused the tissue donation. So here again, we discussed with the coordinator and the team, and we found that the families had the reservation that all the organs are within the body, but the cornea is outside the body, and when they would take the body to their village, there would 
could be a question as to why was this done. So here again, we made an effort. We then took before after photographs, gave it to the counselors, gave it to the organ donation team and said that, please talk to the donor family so that there is no uh, gap. So here again, cornea donation provides comfort and cornea does not lead to any face disfigurement. Next, please. So this was a very unexpected the promotion, motivation, efforts to always engage the hospital staff, the nursing staff, the ICU staff in all activities. Next, please. Again, we continuously monitor and even the non-utilization of cornea, we could keep looking at it to make sure that there is no gap in a utilizable cornea, which is not used. If any change in the protocol is required, such as the death preservation time, we keep changing it according to the season and depending upon the culture results. Next, please. So eye donation promotion activities go on throughout the year. And then we have the transplant coordinators for which we have a, 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 a nursing officer and a scientist. You can see them in the picture there. We have technologists and we have the patient care coordinators. And of course, there's the entire RPC and AIMS family and the IBANC staff. Next, please. So it is a joint effort of everybody. It is not a single person. Everybody contributes to the ecosystem. Next, please. And another thing I would just share a little bit about uh, pediatric donors. So uh, uh, Dr. Anil did mention that there is no restriction to age. However, many eye banks are not taking tissues from donors less than three years because the cornea is more difficult to handle and it is of a smaller diameter. You keep going next now because the slides will go faster. So here I will say that it's very important for eye banks to monitor and be in close contact with the transplant surgeons. We have many children who are waiting who are less than three years of age. So the donor is less than three years of age. It can be transplanted to a recipient who is less like than three years of age. And um, next please. Please keep going ahead. So here again, if supposing there is some eye bank where they uh, encounter a donor less than three years and they're refusing the donation, that doesn't make sense at all. It is very important that there should be a common waiting list, a common registry, so that the corneas are properly transplanted. Very important to educate those eye banks and those centers that there are other surgeons in the rest of the country who will be able to use a cornea from a young child. So this is what we have an example of a small child who's now had both eyes transplanted. She has good vision in both eyes, has started going to school. There are 330 children waiting for corneal tissue in the waiting list with us. Um, next piece being a high, um, uh, tertiary care referral hospital with extremely trained, high quality corneal surgeons. It is but natural that patients will flock to AIMS for keratoplasty. So uh, I would encourage everybody to make sure that this activity continues. Here's one example of a young donor who was a multi-organ donor. And on the right is an example of another patient, a child who has received a corneal transplant and can now see with both the eyes. Next, please. So I, with that, I'll stop here. Research continues. Translation medicine, I'll explain that research, I want to explain that the cornea has which cannot be transplanted and are not possible uh, for uh, actual therapeutic use and are not medical suitable, medically suitable, they can be used for corneal replacement from the lab for future by regenerative medicine. So again, I would encourage that when the rules are modified, corneal donation can have a separate chapter because there are certain gaps which are happening because it is linked with other tissues and these can be taken care of uh, by including it in a separate chapter so that these few points can be taken care of there. As has nicely been explained, we had a lot of trouble when trained technicians were barred from uh, re recovering and it had to be only an RMP or an MBBS doctor. And we're very grateful to the efforts of everybody for reinstituting the permission for, uh, tra uh, for trained technicians. Similarly, we do have some requirements from any eye banks and it'll be very nice if in the next rules, a separate chapter can be kept for cornea. Thank you very much. With that, I'll stop here. Presentation on the cornea uh, for on the eye donation and cornea transplantation. Uh, definitely, you have given the AIMS experience as well as the National Eye Bank experience, and you have highlighted many of the key, uh, uh, basically key uh, take-home messages for everyone to take home that 
the role of eye donation counselor is very important cornea utilization needs to be improved and that remains a big challenge especially because aims is a tertiary uh, is a highly is a rather a super speciality of with all the facilities is it's available but in many of the peripheral uh, centers uh, the cornea utilization rate is very poor and that is observed and especially in some of the states in middle in middle middle part of the india uh, where uh, the corneas were donated but utilization was poor then you also highlighted the role of the patient care coordinator uh, which is i think a, a good concept we have uh, the transplant coordinator as a organ donor where we divide them into the recipient coordinator as well as the donor coordinator because uh, they because if the volume is large then they both uh, one of them works for the recipient on the recipient part another person works on the donor part so similarly patient care coordinator uh, as you highlighted can play a very vital role uh, in uh, uh, improving the outcomes uh, but uh, and uh, certainly the need for a separate chapter that will definitely last time also we tried to divide Uh, but now we can have a separate chapter also later on whenever the amendment is brought in uh, training uh, but one because because trained technicians have been allowed but sometimes we find that there are uh, gaps in training uh, because if you are not trained then uh, you will not be, you will be damaging causing damage to the cornea during retrieval so that is i think needs to be taken care by the medical colleges where the trained uh, ophthalmologists are available and it because it is not so easy to uh, presume that that these have got trained unless they have done hands on uh, retrieval and i think i i donation uh, on their own so i think some uh, protocol for training uh, needs to be put in place and a minimum uh, duration of training has to be ensured so the if there are any i think in the chat we are not having any question but we if we have if there dr krishan kumar our senior chief medical officer would like to thank ask you questions sir thank mind. you ma- madam for such a nice presentation and uh, i feel that tissues are the lowest hanging fruits and uh, if we uh, put together our efforts we can do a great job in this direction so a uh, few uh, questions madam Uh, what are the contra indications for corneal donations would you please uh, tell us Yes, so known contraindications would be if the patient is known hepatitis B, HCV, or uh, HIV positive. Uh, if the patient has disseminated systemic malignancy such as leukemia or lymphoma. If there is a possibility of highly infectious disease like rabies or COVID, active at the time of death. and um th- then there is a little gray area of active septicemia at the time of death and unfortunately many many places um when they certify the death when it's happened in hospital often septicemia is just mentioned like that that it is a septicemia as a possibility so therefore for septicemia we would say that uh, it is not an absolute it it is written as an absolute contraindication but it depends upon how carefully that septicemia diagnosis has been made so this is something that we can be um, more we can look at it into more that when doctors are certifying septicemia then one could uh, so therefore what we now tell our eye bank staff is if supposing you go and there is a septicemia then you look at the, the um, you also the doctor um, is consulted the medical director and they will see if there any features which are uh, suggestive of active septicemia at the time of death or the treating physician because it definitely it would have taken place in a medical ward or some 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 med, uh, ward under the care of some doctor so we talk to that doctor and let them say that even though the diagnosis is saying suspected septicemia what do they feel and then the last step is then if the family is willing to donate easily with the knowledge that we will culture the tissue and if suitable we will transplant it then we take the tissue we send it to microbiology we i mean we keep the tissue send uh, the medium for microbiology and if we get a negative report and the cornea is very healthy we then transplant it and sorry there's one more uh, possibility of disseminated uh, uh, neurological disease like critzfeld jakob disease cjd so in that comes the category of parkinson's or dementia 
So those are, that, that is one which is again an area which we uh, avoid taking. Otherwise, we take the tissue and then we screen it in the eye bank. And of course, we take a blood sample uh, for the serology testing. Uh, second question, madam. I uh, do there a need to do the ABO compatibility and HLA matching in case of corneas or not? Luckily not. So there have been many studies done in the past where they saw whether ABO in, uh, incompatibility or HLA matching made any difference and it was not adequate. Statistically significant, it did not make a difference. So world over now, it is recognized that it is uh, not required. So that is one thing because fortunately the cornea is avascular and the antigens and we uh, are also very easily amenable to immunosuppressive therapy because we give topical steroids. So therefore, luckily, it's not required at all. Madam, regarding this uh, uh, medium for preservation of cornea. So there are very few products available in the market in India. And I think uh, uh, you are one of the institutions which are, I think, manufacturing uh, in-house this medium. So is it freely available now? Is it uh, uh, costing and how much is it costing? Yeah, thank you for raising this point and it's an extremely important point. So ever since the beginning, ever since Professor Madan Mohan was, you know, started the IBank and he was chief of Konya and chief of the center, uh, he has always, uh, he had started that Makari Kaufman medium would be provided in-house for our center. However, we found that there were many government colleges and government eye banks which were requiring. So uh, almost uh, since 2008, I won't remember the exact year, definitely since 2010, then we approached the Ministry of Health and we said that we are able, uh, capable of providing this medium. So there is a grant from National Programme for Control of Blindness to RP Center Ames by which the medium is provided and uh, is free of cost to all the government eye banks. And then uh, with the corneal preservation medium, which is based on chondroitin sulfate, that the cornea can remain healthy for up to two weeks. Usually we don't need to wait two weeks, but definitely if we can extend to four to seven days, it is helpful. Because if you have to transport the cornea from one place to the other, or supposing there is a very small child with, say, heart disease and kidney disease who has to undergo the transplant, then that can only be done when the health of the child is optimized. So then, you know, if the corn has come on a Saturday evening and the OT day is on a Monday, that such a high-risk child cannot be operated over the, uh, in a non-working hours. You require a whole team, you require ICU backup. So the, the, this uh, other medium, which is the cornisol or RPC sol, it gives you those extra few days. Similarly, if it is a non, if it is a, say a non-optical grade cornea, then if you have to transport it from say one uh, state to another, there again it gives you the extra time. So then we are now providing even this medium free of cost to the government eye banks. Fortunately, Oro Labs is also providing this service uh, to uh, on a payable basis. If I'm not mistaken, the price of one vial uh, is about thousand rupees, which is reasonable. But the problem comes in two ways. What happened is that since it's a government grant, in the middle there was some gap in the release of the next, uh, you know, fund. So here there should be a, a sort of a, a strict order that even if the facilities are not there, there should be some interim. There should be no gap. You know, the fund hasn't come, it's not approved. It should be understood that it has to be approved. What is there to approve in this? So therefore, this should be some such project should have no gap policy. Secondly, there was also some time when the raw materials were not available. This was also a challenge during the COVID pandemic. Uh, for example, the tissue culture medium uh, requires TC199. Then there is also chondroitin sulfate. So here again, Indian pharmaceutical industry should also be bringing this, the, the, the product in India because we are depending on outside sources for some of these raw materials. So this has somebody has to sit and talk about it because uh, it's we cannot have this situation that two, two, three, three months the eye banks are desperate that where is the medium, etc. Of course, in such cases, we can directly transplant. We can go back to the old-fashioned method of moist chamber where we can transplant within 24 to 48 hours. But it's not looking good like such a big country full of resources and we are having to have these gaps in between. Sometimes there are maybe some administrative issues or something. 
and uh, so but uh, definitely those issues can be taken care of and uh, a very uh, a very eloquent talk by you and and you have been a uh, regular uh, we have been going on regular inspections for our new eye banks as well as cornea transplantation center and whenever like you are going as an expert so there is always a demand that they want to have a glass from you during the inspection so this kind of a demand usually because you carry such a uh, experience with you and uh, definitely uh, all the uh, listen all the people who have attended this webinar and uh, listen to your lecture they would have been benefited uh, regarding the, the the all the information that you have given so thank you so much ma'am and uh, for uh, taking out time and giving this very informative and eloquent talk uh, to all, all the all of our audience and uh, basically it was a i think a good cme uh, for all the medical professionals who have attended this national webinar so now i would request uh, my colleague uh, in noto uh, senior cmo uh, dr krishna kumar sir to give a formal vote of thanks to all those who have uh, attended the webinar and the experts and uh, thank you so i have been given the duty to thank you all and it's my privilege to thank you all i start from all of you participants who has taken time on this saturday uh, and uh, you are attending this and i hope that uh, you all and we all together will make this program of ours a great success because it is need of the hour and being the most populated country in the world uh, we have the greatest potential with us so i start then i start uh, with my speakers i thank you dr uh, dr sanjay agarwal and dr uh, akash shukla who has uh, come up with the topics for uh, prevention aspect of liver and kidneys so message was very clear that uh, we should be living a healthy lifestyle with it we should be do, uh, getting the, the regular screening done because early detection is the most important thing so these are the issues then dr sandeep come up with the brain stem death declaration nicely uh, elaborated and i hope that all the hospitals and all the the institutions which has the capability will start doing at least uh, 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 declaring the, the brain that declaration in their respective hospitals then rahul pandit put the light on the maintenance of brain stem death patient who can be be, be uh, kept for uh, uh, organ donation so all my intensivist friends who are listening to this uh, webinar must be a must go and reached by this and they will be now coming forward to declare brain, brain stem death in their icus and then uh, maintaining the brain stem death uh, people so that even if we are losing a patient in icu we are able to save seven or eight more people's life then dr anil kumar sir he uh, elaborately and very uh, clearly discussed the uh, legal aspects of this organ donation and in addition he has put uh, highlighted uh, what our government of india is doing to uh, promote the organ and tissue donation in our country and uh, uh, he has uh, clearly shown that uh, progress is being made and it is with all the efforts of you and we all as a team so we have you have seen in the uh, slides that we have achieved the maximum numbers in many many uh, organ donation diseased as well as live donations and then in the last but not least that come up with the uh, corneal uh, recent advances in corneal uh, transplant what are the new technologies now it is not only that one cornea can be used in one it can be used in uh, uh, more than one patient to she emphasized the importance of pediatric corneal transplants uh, thank you thank you to all then thank you to my uh, 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 then uh, our dg saab is very he is a, a a very very uh, non teacher non academician a physician up to the core 
and he is very very enthusiastic and he is very very uh, uh, focused that and uh, that it is the prevention prevention is aspect of the we should uh, which is the most important whatever we do whatever we uh, we will not able to fulfill the demand if we are not taking the preventing effort, preventive efforts to safeguard our organs so i will request you all please look into it live healthy lives and uh, uh, if donation is the second step please take care of yourself at least don't be become a recipient and in the last i will uh, uh, thank uh, nic team without their efforts uh, mr dan is there and uh, without his efforts we would not we would have not been able to interact with you all throughout our country so thank you thank you very much nic team then thank you to uh, dghs team also directorate uh, team also uh, in this uh, uh, holiday uh, day they have come here and uh, uh, did all the arrangement which are required to uh, interact with you all then in the last my noto team i am highly thankful to you without your efforts and it is uh, uh, under the uh, leadership of our director dr anil uh, and it was basically idea of dr anil that we should first uh, we were planning to celebrate third third of august as organ donation day it's it, it's uh, done every year but he come up with this idea of webinar so thank you sir uh, now with this webinar we are able to reach each and every corner of my country and i am able to interact with you all so thank you shaini thank you agresh thank you uh, archana girija bridhushan reena rajesh bharti and shriram thank you thank you very much stay blessed and have a wonderful time thank you thank you very much so thank you we look forward to more such webinars in future so thank you all so thank you for everyone so thank you